Reminder, everybody else, uh, mute yourself while the speaker's speaking. Right. OK. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our faculty seminar today. Uh, as in the past, every first Friday of the semester, fall semester, we'll kick off our seminar series with the faculty seminar to introduce our faculty to everyone, especially to new students, new postdocs, new staff members. So this is our opportunity to know who we are, what we do. And of course, um, you know their contact and you can interact more with them after that. Um, this is important, especially during this difficult time because everything is a virtue and you don't have the usual opportunity to look, knock at the doors. Um, so check their lab, their name and what they do and their email contacts. And if you want to interact more, you know, contact them later. So the purpose is to you know, primarily for, for enrich, to know who we are, what we do, and also is for outreach. We do have our colleagues outside this campus and now we go Anyone online. online. Anyone? Anyone. Um, can everybody mute their microphone? I hear echo. So other people can also join us to learn more about our colleagues. Um, so today we have uh, six speakers. Oh, first, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Chuan Min Hu. I'm a professor of optical oceanography. Uh, we look at the optics uh, and we see how light interacts with the ocean and how light is detected by satellites from which we can interpret what's in the ocean, how they change in response to climate change, to human activities. Uh, that's my group. But today I'm your host and uh, I will moderate this whole seminar series. Um, we have uh, Originally, we planned to have six speakers, uh, but unfortunately, Dr. Gary Mitchin has an unexpected emergent workshop to attend. Um, so we'll stop. We have five speakers only today. Um, in the morning, we have uh, three talks. We'll start from. Uh, uh, we'll start with Dr. Steve Morosky talking about. You know, three bad things and how we deal with this. Um, you know, followed with uh, Bob Weisberg talking about a red tide modeling and understanding. Um, those are pretty bad, you know, pollution events, red tide, harmful algae. But uh, then Dr. Frank Miller Carger will shine some lights on the future um, to show the hope. Okay. So that's the morning session. In the afternoon session, we'll shift gear, talking about other topics on uh, marine uh, animal, their, their response to temperature, um, and also how to understand the ecosystem as a whole by combining models and observations. So that's the schedule for today. The, between the two sessions, we have about one and a half hour for uh, lunch, you know, for a break. So I hope you can come back after the lunch. You know, don't get sleep sleepy, and uh, you know, we have exciting topics in the afternoon as well. So with that, um, I will pass to Dr. Steve Moraski. Um, see if you can share your screen. Stop sharing. Okay, can you see that, Shawnman? Yes. Okay, well, um, welcome back, everybody, and certainly welcome to the new students in the system. Um, this has been a very busy year for us, despite COVID. Um, lots of things have transpired in the uh, local environment, particularly in the ecosystem of Tampa Bay. And so, um, my colleagues and I, and these are mo mostly faculty on the on the staff here, um, are um, trying to are going to uh, present. Um, a, pre a presentation called uh, Bad Things Come in Threes. And we're, we wanna talk about the Piney Point uh, pollution release, um, the red tide uh, episode that happened this summer, and then 
uh, tropical storms. And I, I would note that we have yet another tropical storm uh, potential hurricane coming into the Gulf. So, you know, perhaps this is timely as well. Um, two images that you see here are um, off the dock uh, on the left hand side uh, here at CMS. Uh, a massive uh, uh, fish kill uh, resulting from the red tide episode. This picture was taken in June. And on the right hand side, you see uh, uh, some pretty nasty water being released from the Piney Point facility over on the east side of the bay. The real um, important scientific question um, that these three bad things uh, to the bay um, uh, represent, however, is, is there any connectivity between these events or are they just three random events that happened? And so what I'm going to try to do is to look at each of these events in more detail and then see if there's any intersection between all three of them, because um, if there in fact is intersection, then that means um, human activities um, may, be mit may, may mitigate some of the uh, potential uh, harmful effects of these things. So the Piney Point spill um, that happened, um, uh, just a little bit of the scenario here between March 30th and April 8th, uh, about 10 days, uh, estimated 215 million gallons of polluted waste was discharged from the Piney Point fertilizer processing facility uh, over on the left hand or the right hand side of the bay into Port Manatee Harbor. Now the water was known to be moderately acidic. Um, previous um, releases from from other facilities there have been much more acidic and much more detrimental. This had a pH of about four, which is like acid rain and slightly less acidic than orange juice, right? Um, uh, but it was very high in various sources of nitrogen, both uh, both organic and inorganic nitrogen, and especially ammonium. Um, high levels of phosphates, of course, and then um, also um, some of the sampling has indicated um, uh, levels of radionuclides, uh, uh, particularly radium-228, which uh, has a half-life of about six and a half years. And then there are other constituents in this release as well, especially high levels of chloride and other salts. So um, I'll talk a little bit about Piney Point in some detail here. Um, the facility is located on at Port Manatee, which is uh, as indicated by the red circle here over on the east uh, lower east side of the bay. Um, this is a shipping port, um, but of course uh, in central Florida there are substantial um, phosphate mines and uh, this was one of the closer ones to the bay. Uh, most of these mines, about 25 different uh, mines, exist in central Florida. Um, this is the facility uh, at Piney Point. You can see um, if you see the, 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 the thin yellow line, it starts from these two retention ponds and goes out to the west, and then it's joined by the blue line. So what happened was when this facility started to leak, um, because um, there was fear that there would be a massive uh, rupture of the containment, um, there was a controlled release of the 215 million gallons uh, through to the central part of the, uh, the harbor through a pipeline. Um, so this is a close up of what that uh, uh, facility looks like. Um, you can see that there are two large retention ponds uh, and then there's something called the gyp stack. This is a fossil gypsum stack and I'll show you a profile of this in a minute. Um, this is basically what remains after uh, phosphate fertilizer is processed and and ironically, this is a facility that's been closed for 20 years. So this is just just basically the garbage left over from mining uh, phosphate. Um, so what is a gyp stack? Um, it sort of looks like a Mayan temple um, of phosphogypsum. Phosphogypsum is the result of taking the uh, the mined phosphate, uh, treating it with um, acids and um, basically uh, taking off the more or less pure uh, phosphate. This is what's left over. Uh, it's in a retention facility uh, with a high density polyethylene liner. Um, it does not see, uh, seep into the groundwater nor into the bay, at least it's not supposed to, uh, has a, um, a, a liner that contains this. And so what happens is as rainwater uh, accumulates, it fills up. And, and so actually um, this uh, facility is filling up even as we speak. Um, and so what happened was in this uh, particular event, there was a puncture in the uh, polyethylene liner and it started to leak. And so um, rather than uh, risk a catastrophic uh, collapse of this system, uh, the water was pumped out. It's pumped out into Port Manatee, which is a major uh, commercial hub. It does about $5 billion a year in commercial shipping. Um, it is the busiest port 
the closest um, large port to the Panama Canal. Uh, of course, there are other ports uh, that are relatively close by, but still uh, a lot goes through th that port, including an awful lot of just gypsum uh, uh, phosphate fertilizer. Um, the release point is actually right behind one of these uh, one of these uh, uh, freighters. Um, so it's just pipeline that uh, goes out into the bay. So we've been asked a lot of questions about Pining Point. Um, what is the source of the water pollution? As I just explained, how much was released? About 215 million gallons over 10 days. Where did it go? We'll talk about that. Is it still in the bay? Um, talk about that too. Uh, what are the chemicals that were released? I think we know um, uh, what they are. Are they harmful to marine life? Generally, yes. Um, can we eat the fish? Uh, yes. Um, what are the impacts of these releases on biota in the bay in general? And that's uh, an open question. Who's monitoring the bay and how often? Lots of people, and we'll talk about the data. Um, much more research. Yeah, we need some more research on this. Um, how will the Piney Point problem be solved? Um, this is a big political question. We can talk about it with questions. And what other pollutants are, are of concern in the Bay other than these pollutants as well, like uh, chemicals like PFAS and others? So lots of questions that we've been asked as uh, as um, as College of Marine Science, and I know our colleagues at Florida Fish and Wildlife and Florida DEP and the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, they're all asked, um, being asked these kinds of questions. So um, Bob Weisberg and Yanggang Liu on staff here um, have been doing some pollution uh, modeling to see where, in fact, uh, we could anticipate Piney Point to actually um, uh, transit in terms of the bay. And so they've run their um, a version of their hydrodynamic model with particle tracers being ejected into the uh, into um, the location right at, at, at Piney Point with the beginning of the spill. And so what you see here are uh, six panels. Uh, basically, these are days running from June the 30th, which is uh, um, the beginning of the spill uh, up in the upper left-hand corner, um, running to um, uh, April 10th, which is two days after the spill um, uh, terminated. And so what you can see is the progressive um, expansion of the particles um, into the bay and then ba basically being transported. Um, by and large, what you see is that um, the uh, transport um, was primarily on the south and eastern side of the bay, although um, by the um, by the uh, April 10th, you can see that there's a fairly substantial um, uh, transport to the middle bay and then some outside of the bay. And this simulation um, is actually from um, uh, a a few days in May, a four day period in May 19th to 23rd. And you can see that um, uh, by and large, the um, uh, whatever tracer is left uh, is well represented in the bay, except for maybe um, uh, old Tampa Bay uh, up in the, in the northern corner. Uh, it's pretty widely distributed. Importantly, um, this is at concentrations about three orders of magnitude lower than the initial tracer. So this gives us some idea that a lot of the areas of the bay would have been impacted at least at some level by um, by releases. So um, in terms of other studies, there was a substantial amount of uh, bay-wide studies conducted by um, University of South Florida uh, with uh, with the uh, Florida Institute of Oceanography helping out by um, use of their Weatherbird 2, as well as uh, studies by Eckerd College, FWRI, FDEP, Tampa Bay Estuary Programs, lots of people sampling here. This is a really interesting photograph. Um, this was taken by a satellite on April 8th. And if you see uh, up in the corner entering the bay, there's a little ship there. Well, actually, this is a picture of the weather bird actually out sampling that day. So it was taken uh, uh, by this Maxar digital, digital globe worldview. Um, so um, you can see that, um, you know, uh, we were on station doing, doing our thing out there. Um, so these are the uh, sampling stations um, that the Weatherbird did over a series of cruises in, uh, in mostly in April. Uh, and this was led by Kristen Buck and, and others. Um, so fairly substantial uh, sampling. Uh, and I want to focus on those stations right there, USF-6. And this is very close to the, the Piney Point facility. Um, so if you look at um, the amount of phosphate uh, concentrations in the samples, that water samples that were taken there, you can see that um, uh, by the set on the 7th, uh, 8th of April, uh, where you saw the weather bird actually sampling, uh, relatively high uh, levels of phosphate in the water, about three milligrams per liter. Uh, but in progressive sampling, you can see that um, uh, by um, the end of April, it's back uh, below the baseline level, which is this blue level um, here. Uh, 
And the same thing for chlorophyll uh, A in the water, um, uh, very high levels of chlorophyll, um, but the, uh, they were substantially reduced by the end of April as well. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done by the DEP and, and uh, Tampa Bay Estuary Program. And so these are some samples of two forms of nitrogen that were sampled in the bay. And you can see that the Keldal uh, nitrogen, which is basically both the combination of organic and inorganic nitrogen, um, peaked um, around, um, around the 7th of April uh, w during the active release. But um, actually by, by the uh, middle end of the sort of middle end of the um, month, it had gone down to basically the 2020 average in terms of, of uh, total nitrogen in the bay. So it, it dissipated relatively quickly in the vicinity. And this, this is, these are averages of multiple samples. And the same thing for ammonium. Um, it peaked uh, on the on the fifth and then on the seventh in, in terms of the samples taken. But by um, the middle of April, ammonium had actually um, been reduced substantially as well. So one question that we have, of course, is um, did this elicit any kind of plankton bloom? And so this is work that Chuan Min and his um, colleagues um, did. Um, the top row is really interesting because he looked at all Aprils from 2016 to 2020 uh, in terms of satellite imagery that would show whether or not there was any uh, um, any plankton blooms, right? So uh, in terms of chlorophyll concentration. So you can see in, in terms of all the um, panels here, there really has never been a significant bloom of plankton in the area of Piney Point uh, in, a, in any of the Aprils that were examined. But if you look at the sequence for 2021, you can see starting on April, perhaps around April 6th, and then moving uh, particularly through April 9th, you can see that there was in fact a plankton bloom here, but it had actually dissipated by the end of April. And of course, um, this was a, certainly a plankton bloom, but not a, a bloom that um, incorporated um, Karenia brevis, which is the, the primary red tide uh, plankton. And so it does seem like there was a, a local plankton bloom. And this is confirmed by imagery that, that Frank supplied. Um, if you look at uh, the imagery from uh, Sentinel 2B, um, so you can look at the April 3rd imagery and you can see down in the square here, um, there is you know a little bit uh, of what appears to be um, brownish tinge on the eastern side of the bay, but but certainly this is amplified on April 8th. And I can tell you being out on the water on April 8th, there was in fact a substantial amount of, of plankton at the surface. All right, so, so there was a plankton bloom there. So, and, and you can see this in chlorophyll monitoring uh, from the DEP website as well. During the discharge, um, there was substantially elevated um, uh, levels of chlorophyll around the facility, but after the discharge, it, it dissipated. So there was also uh, a variety of sampling from small boats, and this is uh, primarily the work that Eckerd uh, College uh, and USF collaborated on uh, in these stations, and this included looking at pH, temperature, sediment grabs, and even some fish. Um, so um, there's a day marker out near the bay. And these are some of the demersal fishes, and these are some of the uh, pelagic fishes that were collected in, in the region and analysis of that is ongoing now. Um, the interesting thing is you can actually see a, 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 a pH uh, reduction signal there, uh, not dramatic, but certainly uh, um, important. Um, if you look at the two sampling dates, April 7th, they're in spill right near um, the release point. And in fact, we were able to sample right at the release point. You can see that there is a depression in the pH levels, but, but um, about two kilometers Beyond, you can see that it is pretty much at the at the um, the, the level of the bay, uh, about 8.5. So so um, are there potential um, uh, harmful effects of Piney Point? Sure, um, there's a history of plankton blooms, uh, red tides. Um, uh, based on other uh, episodes, um, they haven't generated red tides necessarily, but they have generated plankton blooms. Um, what about the acidic conditions and the other levels of chemicals? A lot of this is ongoing uh, and seafood safety issues. Um, probably not. So what about red tides? Um, where do they come from? You know, um, uh, in particular, if you go down this list of questions, um, is the current red tide bloom related to Piney Point releases early in this year? And how does this um, the nitrogen that uh, was generated by Piney Point compared to other sources. And this has been a significant issue in terms of um, 
understanding uh, causality. So the culprit, of course, in red tide is Karenia. This is a picture of it. This is a typical um, harmful algal bloom. You can see it, um, some uh, habs look reddish in color, some do not. Uh, and on the west coast of Florida, there is a persistent bloom. Um, this is the timing of the bloom scenario. You can see that um, it started um, in February down off Cape Coral, and you can see a progression uh, over time. Uh, these are monthly collections of all the uh, the Karenia um, sampling data processed by FWRI and uh, basically put up on the NOAA website. And so all the X's represent negative Karenia uh, counts in terms of the plankton. And you can see a progression over time uh, from March where, you know, there was a lot in uh, in uh, uh, Port Charlotte uh, Bay, and then it kind of worked its way up uh, by, um, by April. There was some off of, um, of Sarasota, but Importantly, in April, there was, and this is entire month of sampling, there wasn't any Karenia inside Tampa Bay. Uh, however, in May, um, you started to see uh, Karenia in the uh, in the area of Piney Point, and then by June, you know, it, it flared up, and in July, of course, um, this is when the major fish kills happened. Now, interestingly, th these are the most recent data, and we expect new data to be released by FWRI today. Um, you can see in the month, uh, first week of August, um, and the second week, uh, very little inside the bay, but still there's persistent Karenia um, uh, 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 bloom out on the coast. So is the uh, 21, uh, 2021 red tide related to Hurricane Tropical, uh, Tropical Storm Elsa? Um, it was technically a hurricane when it passed Tampa Bay on July 6 and 7. And is it related to Piney Point, where there was an estimated 205 tons of nitrogen compounds released? So this is an interesting plot of, uh, of the scenario of, um, of um, Karenia brevis um, density in the middle and lower Tampa Bay up on the upper left-hand side. And you can see that it, it peaked the week of Ju July 4th, right? Um, again, um, the um, tropical storm uh, uh, went by on the 6th and 7th. So it was about the same time as the peak, but you can see afterwards um, that the uh, the density of Karenia cells in the middle and lower part of the bay actually fell off very dramatically afterwards. Um, and uh, the um, the uh, polar plot on the right hand side indicates the wind speed and direction. Uh, and you can so you can see that um, as the storm developed, um, it was sort of the wind was sort of blown from the the north a little bit at relatively. Um, uh, mo moderate levels of about five meters per second. As the storm came on, you can see that the wind speed uh, shift, uh, the wind direction shifted over to the southeast and it maxed out around 23 um, meters per second. And then as the storm passed, it fell off to the southeast. Um, so the point here is that um, there really wasn't a lot of wind um, uh, derived um, uh, uh, flow that would would have necessarily pushed um, this um, into the bay based on the the buoy um, data that we've got for 42 um, 13, which is um, what Bob Weisberg's um, C10 buoy. Um, so, what about all these intensive efforts to collect and burn the dead marine life? Um, uh, th these are two pictures of uh, the very intense effort to pick up a lot of dead fish around the bay. So, um, uh, in just in terms of um, looking at Piney Point relative to the the nitrogen budget, um, in in uh, the last five years, Tampa Bay has averaged uh, a nitrogen input of about about twenty five uh, thirty five hundred tons per year, uh, and so Piney Point release was about two hundred and five tons, uh, which was about six percent of the average. Um, uh, uh, nitrogen loading for the entire bay, but in the um, the lower bay uh, where um, the amount of nitrogen is 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 relatively modest, um, it was about equal to a total annual inputs from all sources for that part of the bay um, uh, of about 200 tons. Um, the dead fish are interesting because the last estimate I saw was about 1,800 tons of dead fish. Um, if you assume that they are composed of about 3% nitrogen. We ended up picking up, or we, um, the cities picked up about 55 tons of nitrogen that uh, was not potentially released back into the bay as potential fuel. And so you have to ask the question, you know, why, why does something like Karenia 
killed um, marine life. Well, when you think about it, you know, their fuel is nitrogen. And so by killing uh, the uh, animals like the, the fish, um, basically you can potentially prolong the, uh, the, the plankton bloom. So let's put 205 tons of nitrogen from, from the Piney Point release into perspective. Um, this is the time series of nitrogen inputs into Tampa Bay, uh, and it includes um, five different sub areas, Old Tampa Bay in the north, Hillsborough Bay, which is, you know, basically the city of Tampa, um, mid, the Middle Bay, the Lower Bay, and then the remainder of Tampa uh, Lower Bay, which includes Boca Ciega, Manatee River, and Terracia. Um, and of course, um, Piney Point was located in the, the upper right quadrant of the Lower Tampa Bay, right? So you can see that um, overall uh, nitrogen inputs to the bay peaked at around 7,000 tons in 2003 and then went down fairly dramatically, but it's been increasing fairly significantly since then. Um, the major source of total nitrogen is Hillsborough Bay, which is the most industrialized part of the bay. Um, the other three sections that contribute about the same are Old Tampa Bay, um, the middle, and then the remainder. And then Lower Tampa Bay, as I said before, um, has the lowest quantity of, of total inputs. And when you look at the sources of uh, w where it's all coming from, uh, if you look at um, all the areas except Lower Tampa Bay, it's primarily non-point source residential um, uh, runoff. Um, in Lower Tampa Bay, it's actually atmospheric that contributes the most, but again, there's only about 175 uh, tons per year that go in there. So, so clearly, um, in it, putting that uh, 205 tons into perspective, uh, it probably, you know, it was a significant uh, input in terms of the Lower Bay, but again, as Bob's simulation showed, um, th this nitrogen was distributed throughout the bay, and so, so um, you know, there's there's some perspective here. So, oh, just some final thoughts. Um, it's likely that anthropogenic nitrogen inputs into the bay probably result generally in more intense and prolonged uh, red tide events locally. It's hard to say that Piney Point um, induced this because of the dissipation of the Piney Point nitrogen uh, prior to the event. Uh, certainly more research on the timing is needed. And, and more importantly, there's, there's a lot we can do to minimize nitrogen pollution into the bay especially in terms of non-point sources, which uh, would certainly have positive impacts well beyond just red tide mitigation. And I wanted to show you this movie here. Um, this is actually taken behind my house. And this is what non-point source pollution actually looks like. These are open storm sewers that are draining off lawns, they're draining off the streets, et cetera. And they're injecting a big dose of nitrogen, phosphate, and other sources of pollutants. Uh, into the bay every day. And again, this accounts for about two thirds of nitrogen pollution that goes into Tampa Bay. So with that, I want to thank my co-authors and certainly um, if there's a time for a question or two, I'm happy to answer them. And thank I, you, Steve. I we do have time for questions. Your, your, your timing is perfect. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, anyone has who has questions, you can either post your question in the chat box or raise your hand and um, unmute yourself and ask, answer, uh, uh, post your question to, to Steve directly. Thank you. We do have time for questions. I would ask any of my co-authors to correct any uh, mistakes I've made because um, a lot of this is not my field. It was perfect, Steve. So, so Dave Nar asked the questions. What are the future plans for Piney Point? Now, thank you for asking that question, David. Um, and I said in, earlier in the talk um, that this is um, very controversial. One of the plans that they have right now, um, the, one of the problems with with Piney Point is that it is again filling up. And, you know, it's filling up with all, all the rain that we've had this summer. And so there are plans afoot to basically process some of the um, chemicals out of the waste and re-inject it back into the bay. And so this, you know, basically, um, you know, uh, sets up a scenario where potentially, you know, depending on how uh, well the, um, the facility, you know, can process, you know, out some of the pol potential pollutants, uh, we may see a, a recurrence of some part of this event. Um, I think the long-term plans are trying to trying to basically um, reduce the amount of pollution 
And, you know, there've been talk about, you know, injection wells and other things, but I'm not really sure about that. Well, back in 2003, there was a, another piney point event. So the strategy, strategy was to have a barge operation to carry this treated west water to the center of the Gulf of Mexico, just dump the water. <laughs> so th that's another way. But, you know, um, make it somebody else's problem, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and, and this, you know, this is just one of the 25 facilities that are out there. And of course, this is a closed facility, so there's no more money left, you know. And so, um, so, you know, this is a, this is going to be a public responsibility at some, you know, at some point to, to actually solve this problem. Any more questions? Well, if not, let's thank Steve. What excellent summary of uh, the Pining Point and other events. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so next, we will have Bob, Dr. Bob Whiteberg. Yes. Hello. Yes. So are you going to uh, okay. post my talk, or do I have to do that? Go ahead. <laughs> Are you going to post my talk or do I do that? Uh, if you can, please. All right. How do I do that in Teams? Oh, uh, there is a, an arrow, arrow on arrow. the upper right corner. Okay. Great. You see it? Yes. Okay. Okay. So welcome everybody. What I'll do today is, is talk a little bit more about the physics of red tide. And so the title is K Bros Habs on the West Florida Shelf. What we think we know, what we know we don't know, and what's happening lately. So um, let's go through an abstract first. Um, continental shelves come in varying widths. Narrow shelves are readily impacted by the adjacent deep ocean. They tend to be rich in nutrients and very highly productive. Wide shelves, generally insulated from deep ocean influences, may have nutrient deplete or oligotrophic zones. Two factors are in play. The first is how far landward deep ocean influences may extend onto the shelf. And the Rossby radius of deformation, which is the distance over which the pressure gradient and velocity fields adjust the geostrophic balance is a measure of that distance. Uh, it's about 30 kilometers for the West Florida Shelf. The second is how far seaward land influences may extend onto the shelf. And you can see this in salinity fronts associated with fresh water drainage. These extend about 10 to 20 kilometers for the West Florida Shelf. So given that the shelf width generally exceeds 120 kilometers, much of the West Florida Shelf lacks either direct deep ocean or land influences, and hence it is considered to be oligotrophic. But this begs the question, how can an oligotrophic shelf be so productive? The answer lies in the physical oceanography of the West Florida Shelf. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, here's the geometry and a, and a place, very special place, we call the pressure point, which is just west of the dry tortugas. The red uh, line that you see is 30 kilometers, the approximate Rossby radius deformation. And so you can see that doesn't cover much of the shelf at all. However, at the pressure point where the shelf slope is in very close proximity to very shallow isobaths because these must all wrap around the dry tortugas, which is the westernmost um, islet of the, of the Florida Keys chain. So if the Gulf of Mexico loop current, which has a pressure perturbation associated with it, if that comes in contact near the dry tortugas, 
at the pressure point, it can actually set the entire West Florida shelf into an upwelling favorable motion, which by virtue of um, the physics of the bottom Ekman layer can carry fluid of deeper ocean origin, which is higher in nutrients. You can carry that fluid across the entire West Florida shelf, thereby eliminating that oligotrophic zone under certain conditions. So the West Florida shelf is kind of unique in that the southern portion of it is partially closed by the Keys. And so if you put a high pressure perturbation right near the dry Tortugas, it will cause a pressure gradient force to exist from the shelf slope right across to the near shore, driving a southward geostrophic current, which then turns to the left in the bottom Ekman layer, causing an upwelling circulation. And if this persists long enough, you can actually change the water properties of the entire West Water Shelf. So, you know, the basic question is to be oligotrophic or not to be oligotrophic. And to not be oligotrophic, the shelf has to get nutrients. And by virtue of the physics of the circulation relative to the geometry of the West Water Shelf, we have a way of getting new inorganic nutrients of deep ocean origin onto the West Florida Shelf, despite the fact that it's so wide. Okay, so with that as background, let's uh, make application to Corinia Brevis Red Tide. Uh, we know, it, what, what do we know? Well, it is the bloom of a toxic dinoflagellate called Corinia Brevis that occurs quite naturally. It's always there to some level and when it blooms it uh, becomes a nuisance it usually initiates offshore under oligotrophic conditions so right in the middle of the continental shelf it looks like between about the 30 to 40 meter isobaths along the bottom it manifests as a nuisance once transported and concentrated at the coastline and both the offshore conditions and the transport are determined by the ocean circulation. So what we can say right away is that the ecology of Cornea brevis red tide is not, and I'll say, be emphatic about it, it is not biology. It's the whole shebang. And the physics of the ocean circulation are every bit as important to Cornea brevis ecology as the biology. What don't we know? Well, do humans exacerbate red tides? By uh, runoff, as Steve just said, uh, sewage spills, phosphate stack spills. And I'll have my own opinion on that a little bit later on. And what, what we also don't know is what terminates a red tide bloom. Now let's get back to um, the geometry again. So on the left-hand panel is a plot of all of the K. brevis cell counts by FWC from 1953 to 2015. And what's very clear is that the region from just north of Tampa Bay to south of Charlotte Harbor uh, is the epicenter for K. brevis red tide on the West Water Shelf. You see secondary regions of, of cell counts in the panhandle, and occasionally we even see it on the East Coast. Um, the White ellipse is where we hypothesize the generation region is for these Corinia brevis blooms. And the white arrows are the direction of transport from the initiation zone to the shoreline. So under certain conditions, we actually can get red tide from that initiation zone to the panhandle. And under certain conditions, we can get it on the East Coast. And we've, we've documented both of those. The right-hand panel, you see a model simulation of the near-bottom circulation. Those are the, the arrows, the black arrows. Uh, in June 6th of 2010, a time when the loop current was in contact with the pressure point and had set the entire West Water Shelf in motion. So you can see that upwelling circulation 
you can see relatively cold water right near the shoreline, um, the, the transport of this deeper water across the shelf. And we actually have real observations of that to back up the model simulation. And so what you, what you can see in that picture is the transport pathway from the deeper ocean or the middle shelf to the shoreline, showing that the reason why Tampa Bay to Charlotte Harbor is the epicenter really has nothing to do with Tampa Bay or Charlotte Harbor. It has everything to do with the geometry of the West Florida Shelf relative to the transport pathway uh, within the bottom Ekman layer. So um, the, the circulation actually determines the spatial distribution of certain ecological phenomena on the West Florida Shelf. Um, so let's now take a look at how we're analyzing certain data and coming up with certain concepts of how red tide works. So we took a pro an approach. The argument is that if the pressure point is important, loop current interaction at the pressure point is important, then there should be some relationship between the loop current behavior and perennial brevis, red tide blooms. So we took the approach of using what's called the self-organizing map, which is a neural network technique that allows us to take a whole slew of realizations of loop current behavior, project them onto a limited subset of patterns, and uh, therefore just be able to describe using a, a limited subset of patterns, the evolution of the loop current over this entire time period for which we have joint um, uh, loop current and corneal brevis uh, information. And just to give you an idea of what the loop current is doing right now, that's the lower right-hand panel. It's uh, sea surface height by satellite imagery and geostrophic velocity vectors estimated from the sea surface height, which are the arrows. You can see the loop current coming in uh, through the Yucatan looping around going pretty far north into the Gulf of Mexico, eventually coming back, which is why it's called the loop current, and exiting through the Straits of Florida. And the other reason I'm showing this is we have a, a tropical storm, which is scheduled to become a hurricane shortly, making landfall near um, um, the Mississippi River Delta. And you can see that hurricane is going to go over um, the loop current which has a deep thermocline, it's relatively warm water, and therefore the water will stay warm even as the hurricane passes because the thermocline is so deep. And therefore that storm is projected to uh, intensify. And we may have, a, may have a serious situation on our hands later on in, in the weekend. So that's what the loop current is doing right now. And so when we do this projection, we, we projected 23 years of altimetry data onto 20 different patterns. And you can see those patterns. The ones highlighted in magenta are ones in which the loop current is in contact with the pressure point. And the lower panel is a time series over those 23 years of the, the patterns, how the patterns evolve. And you can see there are certain periods of time when we have persistent um, magenta looking patterns or translated physically, persistent interactions of the loop current with the pressure point. And this is what, what's been going on this past year. We had some pattern, um, pressure point patterns that were kind of intermittent early in, in uh, spring. They didn't really last long enough to reset water properties. And I'll get back to that later on. But um, the suggestion is. Well, I'll get to that later. OK, so this is how we put together a, um, a very crude Occam's razor approach to seasonal prediction. The magenta looking time series is K brevis and uh, anything above 10 to the sixth. The thin line is, is a major bloom. So you can see in some years you have major blooms, other years you don't. Um, and then the green are times when we thought that the pressure point 
interaction was at the right time of year and long enough to um, reset water properties. And so what you see then is when there's a green arrow, we generally do not have a major red tide subsequently. When there is not a green arrow, we tend to have major red tides. Doesn't work every year, but um, this very simple scheme suggests that for six out of eight years when there was no bloom, um, this very simple uh, uh, crude Occam's razor approach works. And for 16 out of 20 years, when we did have major blooms, again, we were successful. So for 22 out of 28 years, extending this into the present time, um, this very simple seasonal prediction scheme seems to be functional. And this is just kind of a scorecard. So um, uh, there are outliers. 2016, 2020 are two such outliers, especially recently, and I'll get to those in, in, in a minute. So there's a nice caveat to the Occam's razor approach. Red tide is more complex than simply the loop current hitting the pressure point. Um, all, all natural phenomena are, are complex. And so we don't expect this to work perfectly, but it seems to be working reasonably well. And I'll get to some explanations, I think, of 16 and 20. All right, this is what happened in 2018. You may recall if you were here, uh, trust me if you weren't, 2018 probably rivaled 2005 as the worst of our recent red tide um, blooms. It was really horrible. Um, two factors were in play. The 17 bloom, Never dissipated. We don't understand that. It's another unknown. It never dissipated. It lingered around. It was particularly prevalent from Venice, Florida, southward. And um, in 18, the offshore, offshore conditions were conducive for a new bloom to form. And uh, we did have a loop current interaction with the pressure point too late to stop any red tide bloom but just in time to transport whatever was out there to the beach. And so if you look at the lower left-hand panel, you can see from uh, uh, September, October of 17 through the, the um, into 18, the very normal 17 bloom just lingered, didn't go away. And then all of a sudden in 18, we got this new uh, infusion of, of red tide from the initiation region, and it really exploded into uh, a, a really major bloom. The red dots are when we started seeing the bloom on the panhandle, and the blue dots are when we started seeing the bloom on the east coast. Uh, the red dots started right after Tropical Storm Gordon went by, and so um, when we did some Simulations, you can see the transport of particles from the initiation zone up to the panhandle. So we can attribute the panhandle portion to the same initiation zone um, uh, caused by, by Tropical Storm Gordon. And um, because we had such strong persistent upwelling, we were able to transport some of the cells that were along the beach offshore along the surface around the keys and up to the east coast and we also did some simulations of that so the entire region the panhandle the epicenter region and the east coast can be attributed to the west florida shelf mid shelf typically oligotrophic um, initiation zone for corinia brevis red tide okay um just to demonstrate the transport pathway, we had a, a glider uh, transect uh, that went from 825 through 913. And so that the red crosses are where the glider actually sampled elevated chlorophyll along the bottom. We seeded our model with um, neutrally buoyant particles and we tracked them three-dimensionally. The color coding is the, the water depth. 
you can see that um, whatever was in the initiation zone would have reached the beach um, across the entire epicenter region. So that kind of confirms the figure that I showed you earlier. Um, so then if the circulation is responsible for where we see the red tide, might it also be responsible for the bloom termination? So we tried to look at that question. Here are monthly maps of K. brevis observations from FWC. And um, uh, they have a wonderful gallery. They, they have this information for every month. And I, I uh, encourage you to go take a look at that and, and look at how red tide is varied on the West Florida Shelf. But what you're looking at here is September um, 2018 through February of 2019. And you can see how the, the bloom evolved. By December 18, it was gone in most places. In January, there was a little bit of a resurgence between Charlotte Harbor and the Keys. And then by February, it seemed to be gone again. And so can we account for that simply on the basis of uh, the circulation? So what we did is uh, in, this, in this same model, which we call our West Florida Coastal Ocean Model, we put a tracer, so simply adding another equation with a passive tracer in it, which varies by advection and diffusion. And we, so we put a tracer in on October 2nd, which is the upper left-hand panel, and uh, between the beach and the 10-meter isobath. And we just filled that whole region up, surface to bottom, with this tracer. And um, without any new tracer being added, we asked the question, what would happen to the tracer uh, concentration simply on the basis of the circulation? So namely the advection and diffusion uh, produced by the model simulation. And you can see that by December it was pretty much dissipated. Um, interestingly, at the mouth of the major estuaries, because you have very large tidal currents flowing in and out, the reduction in concentration seems to be the swiftest. And then away from that, it takes a little more time. So it looks like um, if we have an offshore source, and for whatever reason, we shut that source off, so no longer do we have new cells coming in along the bottom, we can very quickly get rid of the, the bloom. Um, this is just a, a, a blow up near the Charlotte Harbor region of what I just showed you before, but what's interesting is because of that geometry, we tend to collect um, uh, cells in that in that little notch in the in the coastline, and so um, oftentimes it's this region where we do see the continuation of a bloom or the persistence of a bloom, and some of that may simply be due to um, the geometry of the of the shoreline. So um, what has occurred subsequently and what may happen this fall? So we um, were fortunate to have a mooring at the pressure point. We were able to put that in two years ago uh, under a National Academy UGOS-1 funding. UGOS is Understanding Gulf Ocean Systems. That's the name of that program. And um, what we see in July of 19 is that there was a, a pressure point contact for about a month. It uh, was too late uh, to do anything to inhibit a bloom, but just like in 2018, just in time to drive stuff to the beach. And then we didn't have any pressure point contact for a long time until 2020. And there it started around March and it persisted. And so this had the ability to alter water properties on the shelf. And we actually argued that there would not be a major red tide bloom in 2020. And yet 
as I said earlier, that was one of the outlier years. And um, the, the bottom plot is a continuation of the same data for another year. Uh, the top is the recovered data. We edited it and, and um, made nice gussied up plot. The bottom is our real time data, so it hasn't really been edited yet. And we'll recover that morning uh, next month. And I'll make a plot as pretty as the one on the top. But yeah, the point is that um, um, we have two years of data, and it kind of gives us an idea of what may or may not be going on. All right, so what happened in 19? Well, here's the red tide concentrations for October and November. We, we pretty much had a two month fairly, um, fairly large bloom. Um, primarily south of Venice, <clears throat> and the timing is very consistent with when the loop current was impacting the pressure point. Again, too late to um, mitigate a bloom, but just in time to drive it to the shoreline. So that seems to make a lot of sense in terms of pressure point forcing. And uh, this is what's presently going on. So. We started, we got a late bloom in 2020. Normally they start September, October. This one didn't start till December. And you can see it's fairly localized around Charlotte Harbor region. And it stayed that way um, for several months. In March, it started to creep a little bit north. In April, it got right to the mouth of Tampa Bay. And in May, it kind of took off as Steve has already said. So how did that happen? Well, um, I'm not going to speculate yet on the origin, but once it was established, we, we do a tracking every day of where red tide cells may go. We get cell counts from FWC, we run our West Water Coastal Ocean model, and we do trajectories and see where those cells might go. So from 4.7 to 4.11.21, you can see that cells that were in the vicinity of Charlotte Harbor were translated northward. And the right hand panel is simply an extension of that from uh, Venice up towards Tampa Bay. And you can see again the continuation of those cells to the north. And since the winds throughout April of 21 were persistently and anomalously southerly, we systematically drove those red tide cells that had been near the Charlotte Harbor region, we drove them right up to the mouth of Tampa Bay. And um, so then once we, uh, once we got towards the end of April, um, these cells are very quickly carried into Tampa Bay by the tidal currents. The tidal excursions are 10, 12 kilometers. And so once you get things at the mouth of the bay, they can very, very easily be carried into the bay. And curiously, on the, the right hand most panel, which is 527, uh, starting on 527, you can see the explosion of very high cell concentrations precisely where the Piney Point spill occurred and precisely where we saw elevated phytoplankton concentrations um, in the beginning of April. So I like to say that um, while conjecture, smoke at the end of the barrel usually means that the gun was fired. And I don't think it's just a coincidence that those highest concentrations literally exploded right where the previous phytoplankton bloom had been. Previous phytoplankton bloom had nothing to do with red tide, but the recycled nutrients from that previous phytoplankton bloom, which are now in the form of organic nutrients, which of course red tide likes, um, you know, that, that, that could have been the catalyst for this explosion of red tide in Tampa Bay. Fish were killed immediately, and of course the Dying fish, as Steve already mentioned, provide a source of nutrients, which then 
can further fuel the bloom. So you don't need to have a continuation of an effluent or a continuous human induced source of nutrients. Once the once you get the bloom, it it's perfectly happy to take care of itself. Um, and and apparently that seems to be what happened. So uh, Tampa Bay turned out to be a mess. Uh, dead fish abounded. Back of my house was full of them. It was horrible. Um, sharks were jumping out of the water to breathe, and the public got awfully antsy. And I was smart. I ran off to Maine to get away from it. But I'm back now. Anyway, um, so that's kind of what subsequently happened. So let's kind of bring this all together. The fundamental question is to be oligotrophic or not to be oligotrophic. And the answer to that question is that West Water Shelf water properties are largely controlled by the circulation. So the ocean physics are of paramount importance for just about anything of an ecological nature on the West Water Shelf. But even as I showed earlier, it determines the spatial distribution of of certain phenomena. Whether or not new inorganic nutrients are upwelled onto the shelf depends upon loop current interactions with the southwest corner of the West Florida shelf that we call the pressure point. Prolonged loop current pressure point contact results in upper slope waters, primarily from the shelf break to about the 200 meter isobath. It results in those waters being transported across the shelf break and towards the shore within the bottom ecton layer. This transport pathway explains why the region between Tampa Bay and Charlotte Harbor is the red tide epicenter region and also a very productive fisheries region. Um, so spatial organization of shelf ecology is again largely owing to the circulation. The West Water Shelf presently has a real-time pressure point mooring as part of the NASM UGOS program. And uh, the primary science question of that program really is what determines the penetration, eddy shedding, and retraction of the loop current. And this is a question that has eluded the scientific community for some 48 years after a seminal paper by uh, Robert Reed of Texas A&M. Um, the pressure point mooring is presently being proposed anew uh, in UGOS, and whether or not it gets funded, I don't know, but um, uh, hopefully it will. Given the pressure point mooring, we're now in a position to speculate on whether or not a major red tide will occur this year. And using our Occam's razor approach, um, the suggestion is that along with COVID-19, the Piney Point spill, and some tropical storms, we may also have a major red tide. The good news is this scheme has failed in the past. So um, in 2016, we also went on, out on a limb and said there won't be a red tide. And by the middle of September, we had the generation of a red tide. Turned out this was about a week or two after there was a major raw sewage spill in Tampa Bay, and not only in Tampa Bay, also in Sarasota Bay and in other coastal communities along the West Florida coastline. <clears throat> Everybody likes to deny that that may be a culprit, but I think it was. Again, it's conjecture. We don't have uh, direct information, but perennial likes organic nutrients um, and sewage is a great supply. Uh, in 2020, again, we didn't think there'd be a major red tide. It initiated late in December. It kind of coincided with releases of Lake Okeechobee water. Um, so again, it's purely conjecture. We don't know, but, you know, uh, human perturbations may be a factor. I, I kind of deviate from Steve's suggestion that the point sources might be the worst thing. I, I think if we stop sprinkling uh, fertilizer on lawns and stop the sugar industry and stop 
the mining that red tide would go away. I don't think so because red tide has been with us long before we had population growth in Florida, long before the sugar industry took off, and long before we did a lot of mining. So it's it's a natural phenomena. Um, we may exacerbate it, but if you have a massive short-lived perturbation, the 215 tons, yeah, it's small relative to the total annual load, but we did that in a week instead of over a year. And so um, it, it's, I think these, these massive perturbations are of great concern, and I think we should do everything in our power to stop doing things like that. Uh, and there are problems we know we can solve. You know, we can fix the levees in Lake Okeechobee. Uh, we could um, uh, decommission Piney Point. As Schwaman said, it's been going on since 2003. By the way, I'm the one that, that influenced the trucking of the stuff offshore. And it's really not putting it in somebody else's backyard because that backyard has a mixed layer of about 50 meters deep versus where it went out of Piney Point, where the water depth, you know, there's other than the channel, the water depth there is a meter deep. And so um, the dilution uh, by trucking it offshore is, is immediate and, and therefore it really doesn't make a major uh, impact. Whereas you stick it in uh, Right in an estuary, it, it, it clearly does, as, as, you, as you saw. All right, well, that's my concluding remarks, and uh, thanks for your attention. I hope you learned something, and if there's time for questions, I'll take them. Thank you, Bob. Very uh, concise and informative. Thank you. Um, now we have time for a couple of short questions. Oh, yeah, one more thing. So. Uh, if anybody's interested, there are a bunch of papers we published, and I'll make them available to you. So, any questions? Yeah, unmute yourself. Just ask question. No, I, I don't need to unmute you. Um, hi, this is Michelle Van Deventer. Uh, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I have one question. There's um, a lot of reference to human influence on red tides that focuses on the chemistry and the nutrient inputs. But I, I wonder about human influence relative to climate change. Uh, there's been recent press about shifts in the, the um, loop current and the AMOC. And I'm wondering how those physical changes in the system uh, related to the temperature and other changes on the current velocity might influence these these red tide events under the scheme that you've described? Well, that's an excellent question. Thank you for raising it. So we have data on temperature in the West Water Shelf, both at the surface and the bottom, for a couple of decades now. And I have not seen what I would consider to be a secular rise in temperature over the um, the small secular rise that we that we detect globally. Uh, it's really the interannual variability that's much larger, and that interannual variability is largely owing to how the loop current impacts the West Water Shelf, or whether or not in, in the winter time we have um, you know, more storms or less storms. Um, also, if you look at the record of transport through the Straits of Florida. There is a cable that's been active now for many years. There again, there's interannual variability, but there's no secular change. And we do see, with regard to the AMOC, we do see periods of time, you know, several years of time when it may decrease, then it may come back up. There is some speculation that it is secularly decreasing. Whether or not that's true remains to be determined. And so um, I have not noticed any climate change related variation in red tide occurrence on the West Water Shelf um, in, in, in the record. 
if you look at the FWC website, you will see that there appears to be more red tide recently than in previous years. However, that is merely a reflection that we've been making a lot more measurements in recent years, especially from the mid 90s onward, when we started having major uh, federal programs allowing us to get out and make observations. So there's a lot more observations of red tide, but that doesn't mean that the intensity or the frequency of occurrence of red tide has increased in, in any way. Um, red tide in, in the Gulf of Mexico was in DeSoto's logbook. So that goes back to the 16th century. Um, there's all kinds of anecdotal information from the late 1800s from uh, fishing on the West Border Shelf of, of major fish kills. And, um, and then into the modern era, of course, we, we actually go out and we collect water and look in a microscope and, and actually look at the cells. But th there, is, there is no conclusive evidence that red tide is either increasing in um, frequency or intensity. Thank you. Thank you. And Don also answered this in the chat box, if you want to check. Um, so we need to move on uh, to our next speaker. Uh, but let's all thank Dr. Weisberg for the wonderful pre presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. So next we have Dr. Frank Mueller Karger talking about uh, M Brown and uh, how we uh, look into the future. Yeah, thank you. Frank, it's all yours. Thank you. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Can you see that? Yes, I see that. Thank you. Thank you, Chun Min. Well, thank you. And, and I think Michelle's question brings us to this topic here. One of the things that both the Steve and Bob talked about our time series and the the one thing that makes time series interesting is that the if you collect data the same way, at least in a consistent fashion, following some standards, you can understand change and how how long term change uh, can be detected by understanding short term changes. This is a problem in biology. Generally, I think Bob showed some time series of, of red tides because that data is collected in the same way year after year. It's been collected like that for a long time. Same thing for nutrients, and especially the physicists have figured this out. The people that do weather forecasting, they've been using standards and sharing data for a long time. So I, what I want to do here is invite you to follow in this program that we're calling Marine Life 2030, that, which is basically just a networking tool that we have kind of put together for the uh, UN Decade of Ocean Science uh, for Sustainable Development. So what I'm going to describe is a program that is built on a bunch of little uh, clusters of things. It, uh, it is funded through NOAA, NASA, BOEM, ONR, a number of people volunteer a lot of time and effort. And we, at the present moment, uh, try to organize everything under the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network and we're going into this that we call Marine Life 2030. So th what drives a lot of this is the economy. We, we need to connect more as oceanographers to what is happening in terms of the, the finances and jobs out there. There's a, uh, uh, an estimate that what we call the blue economy right now is order of one and a half to $2.5 trillion globally, and that it's going to grow to about $3 trillion. This is coming from the OECD uh, as an international group that tries to put these kind of statistics together. So there's other estimates. But what I want to make a point here is that many of these things, uh, uh, the underlying data that is required is some information about biology, be it fisheries, be it uh, aquaculture, be it uh, uh, tourism or some type of water quality, uh, be it mining where you have to do a, a, a environmental impact statements. You need biological data. So this is also uh, a graphic that uh, uh, kind of shows where these jobs are going to be and where this growth in the economy is going to be. All of them have some element of biology, but it, it goes way beyond that. The problem is that at the moment, if you look at the global 
databases for biology and what we're trying to find is whether there's taxonomy information or some type of information about what kind of organisms are in the water anywhere at any one point. You try to reconstruct the history of that in the global ocean or even regionally, except for a few local time series like the red tide or some station like off Bermuda or off Hawaii, single points. You don't have good time series of how or what kinds of organisms are uh, in the water at any one point, and it's very hard then to predict how anything is going to change if you have climate change. So this is what uh, uh, people around the world recognized many years ago. They came up with this Agenda 2030 that we've heard about. These are the sustainable development goals. There's one that is dedicated to marine life. That's uh, uh, Sustainable de Development Goal 14 or SDG 14. And uh, as this moved in 2017, they declared um, the United Nations declared an ocean decade, and this is the ocean decade of ocean science for sustainable development. So it's not the decade for ocean science, but it is intended to connect ocean science and sustainable development, and that's pretty key. So we we shortened the name to the ocean decade. So uh, that was declared in 2017. Last year, they put out a bunch of documents kind of laying out the plan or at least a, a strategy, and they called for proposals for what they call actions. And so these actions could be a number of things. They could be projects which are kind of localized and of limited scope, or they could be programs which are intended to be umbrella kind of uh, schemes that can uh, bring in a lot of people around the world, you know, stakeholders, people of different backgrounds. And uh, so but the intent is to bring the sciences closer to numbers of different people. So the, the decade is structured this way, more or less. If you read a whole bunch of documents, you'll see that they have this diagram and it, it, it summarizes the objectives of the decade, which is intended to generate the knowledge that we need for the ocean that we want. And that's supposed to happen through these decade actions that are the, at the bottom. So you have programs, which are kind of the top level actions and project activities, which would fit under the programs and the whole uh, thing is try to address these challenges like understand pollution, uh, feed people around the world, restore ecosystems and biodiversity, develop a sustainable economy and so on. So the proposal, we wrote a proposal that we call Marine Life 2030. This is our, our preliminary logo at, at the side here that tried to address three of these challenges in terms of trying to provide information for ecosystem and biodiversity uh, protection, protection and restoration, uh, having capacity development in different groups of, of people around the world, especially around standards and methods, and try to inform people in general about how we relate to the ocean. So kind of a uh, outreach effort. So the Ocean Decade in June uh, for Ocean Day uh, announced these the 30 programs that they had selected, plus a number of other actions that they, these are the projects or activities. So there's 30 programs. One of them is Marine Life 2030, but there's a number of other ones, many of them relevant to Marine Life 2030. And so now we're starting to do the, the organization of how do we link to these other programs? How do we uh, bring uh, projects into the fold? How do we get money to fund all of this? So there's a, a, a program on ocean best practices that is housed by the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission at UNESCO. Uh, there's one on Ocean Biomolecular Observing Network or OBON, Challenger 150 and DUES. Those are, there's about five that deal with the deep ocean. And there's some that I think are relevant to the students. And one is on empowering women and one is what we call the ECOPS. And the early career ocean professionals are very embedded uh, in in this uh, this whole process. So if any of you are interested in, in those two and empowering women and early career ocean professionals, please let us know and we'll try to connect you. Down at the bottom is a long uh, URL for the announcement of all of those. And uh, I think that these presentations are gonna be available where you can find the programs that were selected or just send me a note. What we're trying to do under the Marine Life 2030 is bring a number of groups together. And in this circle, it's kind of emblematic, we are trying to bring two major groups together that do ocean observing. Uh, 
One is organized under the Global Ocean Observing System, which is kind of curated or coordinated by UNESCO under the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. So those are all the countries that participate in UNESCO uh, and have a, a say at the IOC. And on the other side, we have the Group on Earth Observations, or GEO, which is, uh, again, the same countries but different representatives, typically countries with an, an operational agency for Earth observing, be it uh, like NOAA or NASA or agencies that, that look at Earth for one reason or another, and they have organized under GEO. GEO has a GEOBAN, a Group on Earth Observations Biodiversity Observation Network, and we established the Marine Biodiversity Observing Network or Observation Network under that. Uh, and we have plenty of conversations between those two. The whole point is to work with uh, international databases and other groups to standardize data, data formats, and flow the data from what is now hard to get data or private data or, or data that are not formalized, for, formatted in a formal way with standards into a, a, a common interface through something like OBIS, the Ocean Biodiversity Information System. That was to lead to indicators and products and so on that you you can use to compare life between one point and another in the world or to understand local change in a global context uh, and to understand changes of life over time, like changes in distribution, for example. The way we do this, and I'm sorry for this kind of complicated diagram, but this is the Global Ocean Observing System uh, framework. It, it was published already way back in 2012, in which the Global Ocean Observing System tries to collect through these international organisms uh, their requirements for ocean observing. With NBON, we organize the community to try to uh, uh, adopt standards for observing, so methods, and standards for data management. And then we pass the information on to the IOC uh, for the OBIS, uh, the Ocean Biodiversity Information System that also lives under UNESCO IOC, and they serve the data, and that data is then available for others to develop indicators and assessments like IPIS and WCMC. There's numbers of acronyms out there trying to make uh, sense of biological data with a little bit of that there is. So men, much of this is, is based on the language of essential variables. Again, going back to the framework for ocean observing of 2012, they they, they try to bring this language of essential variables, building on the quite successful uh, effort to uh, prioritize some variables for the measurement of climate, like the essential climate variables, which the IPCC and uh, now meteorological organizations use. But there is the, the essential ocean variables, and the, um, there's a, an effort to do something similar for terrestrial environments and uh, want to do this for the biodiversity. So this little red uh, intersection here are the biological and ecological e essential ocean variables, which essentially are the primary material that you would use to develop what we call essential biodiversity variables. And, and essential biodiversity variables are nothing else but maps. So basically geospatially arranged time series of these biodiversity variables like genetics and species uh, populations or traits like color or size that help us understand community composition and ecosystem structure. With those maps and time series of maps, you can then develop indicators that uh, other groups would use. But for that, we need the basic data. And so this is what we're trying to do under the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network and Marine Life 2030, is organize these streams of data from satellite data to in situ data, these include genetics and uh, other kinds of data like hydrography, anything that we collect, can collect in situ. Uh, try to understand the data from a taxonomy point of view or from a genetics point of view and combine it with socioeconomic data. So all of these data streams have to be combined to make sense of what is happening or, or if you want to have a socioeconomic model. So the collaborative network links databases you can filter the data through taxa, space, time, and the whole point is to make maps of abundance and trends. So there's nothing new there. It's just organizing the data and making it more available. MBON has is now this this is the projects funded in the United States. There's others around the world. Uh, in the U.S., there is uh, six basically, and one of them, two of them, are 
really run out of USF and one is uh, of Florida, South Florida, and one is encompassing the Americas. And here I'm showing that as a red box around South America because a lot of the effort has been in, in bringing this concept or try to work with people in different labs around the Americas. So the, the one around the Americas is called Pole to Pole of the Americas, and that has been led by Enrique Montes in our college. Uh, it has a number of stations on both sides of the Americas and the Pacific and the Atlantic, again with the same effort where uh, organizing groups on the ground, they have come up with protocols for sampling sandy beaches and rocky shores, so areas that are relatively easy to get to where you can make indicators. And so they, they have established protocols that are now served through the Ocean Best Practices system at the IOC. They continue to collect data. They collect the data in, with a, in the same way in all of these places. They store the data in common formats in a common database. And so everybody can use the same software uh, that is open source uh, and graph everything from satellite data uh, to local time series, including then the time series of organisms on the ground. All of that data is then publicly available through OBIS. In South Florida, we're doing the same thing. We've been working with NOAA and uh, other agencies in, uh, to collect data in these red dots in South Florida since 2014. That's an effort jointly with NOAA, AOML, and a, a lot of other universities and groups. And the program uh, uses the Walton Smith out of Miami. Every two months we go out and we collect data in all these stations. Uh, not only the hydrography, but also collect samples for eDNA, sa net samples for phytoplankton and zooplankton, uh, optics to understand the color of the water and how that relates to satellite data and a number of other biological parameters. An example of what we've done also is working with a sanctuary, the National Marine Sanctuary uh, in the Florida Keys. This is a, I'm not going to read you all the graphs, but the, the two bullets at the bottom uh, show the kind of power that you can get from time series. So this is data that were collected uh, over the past uh, 12, 15 years uh, from uh, by the National Marine Fisheries Service and the University of Miami. And we have analyzed or reanalyzed data in a way to try to understand how uh, fish, reef fish abundance, uh, biomass and uh, uh, biodiversity are changed between inside areas that we call protected areas where you cannot fish, you can dive or you can take pictures, but you cannot fish. And these areas are very small. Some of them are literally the size of a desk or a little bit bigger. So they're, uh, they're small, but there's a few, quite a few of them, although quite a, quite a distance apart. There's one that is a, a little bit bigger, that is an ecological reserve. And so we were curious to see if these protected areas had more fish or more diverse fish than, than just the rest of the Florida Keys where people fish a lot and there's a lot of disturbance uh, on the reef. As you know, the, the reef quality has degraded over the past 30 to 40 years. So we find that basically it's the same. We find the same amount of fish and similar composition of fish inside and outside of the protected areas. And so that was not really the uh, the intent of these areas and I think the problem is that they're too small. The one thing that we found is that high relief reefs a little deeper have higher uh, biomass and diversity than shallower reefs or like patch reefs, but that the difference has been decreasing over time. So these are the kind of things that that you can do if you standardize the data and collect things in the same way. We also, we also use satellite data. There's tremendous efforts to try to combine data from multiple different satellites, some that measure temperature, altimetry, the color of the water, into a classification scheme that we have. Uh, you know, going back to Alexander von Humboldt, he, he looked at the world, took a lot of notes, and made lots of observations. Darwin also used tons of observations that were collected by museums. And then they put it all together, and they invented this concept of bio biogeography. So we're we're taking the same concept and mapping it with uh, satellite data and, and see that these things, these bio, the biogeographic seascapes in the ocean change with time. That's no surprise now today, but if you look at atlases in the past, all of the all of the bio, biogeography that you see is kind of static. So we we're trying to understand now how different organisms or groups of organisms 
are organized in different seascapes. Uh, this is work that Enrique Montes has done here with Maria Cavanaugh at Oregon State in, in South Florida. And we're doing this in a different other several different places around the world where we call it, we compare groups of organisms that may be uh, associated with a particular seascape and see if that those patterns uh, are can be repeatable over time. And this is an example again we find here complexes of phytoplankton where near shore you have more uh, of a bigger complex of big phytoplankton diatoms and such as opposed to offshore where you have smaller uh, once you also have a lot of diet, diatoms and mixed in with uh, dinoflagellates and some of these coastal uh, areas. I'm not going to go very deep into this. We have gone into also uh, uh, pioneering and moving forward the field of environmental DNA. Since we started MBON now, there's a lot of other people doing eDNA, uh, um, working with Maya Breitbart and her group and Annie Jurhus. They published some of the first uh, protocols for eDNA sampling and processing. Uh, Annie did a lot of work and compared different methods to what you can find from eDNA. eDNA is basically taking a, a sample of water and seeing what DNA is floating around it and comparing it to uh, to other types of more traditional samples. And it turns out that you can collect, you can identify many of the organisms that were in contact with that sample relatively quickly, although not yet very cheaply. Uh, Annie did some more work. She did some efforts to try to understand abundance of organisms and how different groups of organisms cluster together in these networking schemes. And she does find some patterns. We did some work comparing the East Coast with the West Coast. All of this is summarized in, in time series that we are trying to present in an easy way to customers, be it the sanctuary managers or others, in what we're calling infographics or webinization of time series. Uh, so you take simple graphics that depict a habitat like this on the left, where you have kind of silhouettes of, of, a, of an organism or a habitat. And if you click on it on the web, it, it links to a database and it, it uh, generates graphics that you can interactively change. And you can change the time scale, the, the Y axis, and you can add a bunch of variables. These graphics are also tied to satellite data. And so you can bring a lot of the different satellite and in situ data together into a common interface that is easy to read for somebody that doesn't have the time or the inclination to get into all these databases. Uh, we're also using, we're trying to do automated identification of patterns. For example, here we, we on the left hand side, we have a, a little tool that is online that Danotis is generated with uh, Luke McEachron at uh, FWC to try to understand whether color patterns that may identify a plume from the coast like turbid water from the Mississippi or coastal water from Texas going over to the flower garden banks. This is another sanctuary uh, in the northwest Gulf of Mexico. And the same thing in the eastern Gulf of Mexico for off of Florida for the Florida Keys. So if you see a, th this thing is trying to see if there's waves of uh, something, a, a patch moving toward the sanctuary and identify it and send an email, for example. So these are time series of that sort of thing. This is an example of red tides that move south and uh, that these tools can catch and send an alert. So Marine Life 2030 is trying to propagate this idea that if we use standards like uh, for data management, we use Darwin Core, that's a very popular uh, uh, data format that has now been advanced to include many different types of data. In, for other people. And why do we want to do that? Because people depend on biodiversity. Is, it is, uh, some, is There's so much of what we uh, depend on in the, in the environment that is tied to different types of life that is unbelievable, and most of us don't even think about it. Yet when you look at these databases of organisms around the world, uh, they are either lacking in many places, or the deeper you go in the ocean, the less data there is, obviously. We want to convert. We want to use these programs to convene stakeholders and, uh, you know, work with people to develop standards and propagate them to the rest of the world, into a global observing system. So we want to work with the global ocean observing system to integrate biology into the observing system on a routine basis. So uh, we are just starting. The decade started 
January this year, 2021. It's supposed to last till 2030 and see how this goes. Some of these programs we want to uh, make sure continue. So that everything, the, you know, everything doesn't just end in 2030. We want to make sure that the whatever we stand up this decade is useful moving forward. So I, I welcome everybody to join us and I want to thank you. Thank you, Frank. That's a huge umbrella I see. <laughs> a lot of room to view things. Yeah, I, I, and it takes a lot of people, so everybody yes. is welcome to participate. Yes. Um, yeah, I see a couple of hands. Uh, David? Yeah, I was interested by your uh, observation that the marine protected areas were too small to show any change of abundance of fish in the Keys area. How much larger would they need to become? I mean, have you looked at larger marine protected areas to see if there's a change in abundance and so forth? Well, we in the Florida Keys, there's a, there's one larger that's about 18 square kilometers compared to these small protected areas that are less than one square kilometer. And at the moment, it's the same, at least in the Keys. Other people, many other people, have looked at marine protected areas around the world, and they find that if you have them close together, like in a network, or if you have large ones, uh, that you do end up with a, an increase in biomass for sure and, uh, and biodiversity also. So I, I think that we don't have one at the moment off of the Florida Keys. Uh, just establishing the Florida Keys in these small protected areas has been difficult politically. And I think that if people uh, uh, want to understand that these things help fishing as opposed to uh, hinder fishing, uh, we have a better a better chance to protect the fish than the coral reefs that people want to enjoy. So there, uh, Steve, I think has his hands up, and he he knows a lot more about this than than I do. But I, I think that it, it has been proven elsewhere, David. Thank you, Steve. You're next. Uh, that wasn't my question, but I'll I'll, uh, I'll get into this um, um, MPA uh, debate. Um, there was just a, a very nice meta analysis done on uh, marine protected areas around the world, and in particular, um, the the edges around them. Um, generally, um, as as Frank said, uh, bigger is better, and uh, I I can relate my personal history be, being involved with. Uh, um, closed areas on the order of 17,000 square kilometers up in New England, they certainly work, you know, for, you know, a variety of species and whatnot. So, so um, yeah, uh, and, you know, the problem with the Keys, of course, it's right next to an urban population center, and so everybody's very jealous of um, their little coral head or whatever, and so it becomes politically very difficult to, to scale up to something that actually can have a major reserve of service. So, so my question, so my my question was um, um, so uh, I really appreciate your discussion about Marine Life 2030, and you know there is a parallel effort you know totally divorced on this called Seabed 2030, and it just seems like if if people are running around particularly in the deeper water doing things, we ought to figure out how to actually make them work together. Um, I wonder if your group at, at uh, Marine Life 2030 has talked about how the intersection between Seabed 2030, which is mapping the world's oceans by 2030 as well, um, and you know if there's or ways to to make sure if we have a vessel out there, we collect you know the types of data that you know because basically if you have a map, you want to do something with it, which is probably put some biology with it. So Anyway, I'll yeah, Steve, I mean, this is the, the reason we named it Marine Life 2030 is exactly because of Seabed 2030. I had many conversations with Craig McLean at NOAA, uh, many other people. I mean, it really, I had a, a, a webinar at the NOMEC and the, the, the Academy's Ocean Shots and so on, where we try to make that link. And there's a, there, obviously, there are some limitations that people that are doing Seabed 2030 feel that they... They're, they have their mission. They, they want to collect data of the bottom as quickly as possible, map the bottom of the ocean by 2030, and they don't want any distractions. The thing is that some of the technology that they're using now does allow for uh, the analysis of backscattering data. In a little, maybe you cannot get biodiversity, but you can get some bottom habitat uh, 
mapping, at, at least some structure. You can get some information about what's in the water column. You may not know what it is, but if you do long time series, you can see how it changes. It moves up and down. It can change in intensity. And so you can see how life may be changing, it, it, at least some traits of biology without knowing the exact who who's who's there no so that the intent is exactly that that's why we called it that and we we are having those conversations on how best to link these programs all of these programs are now in their own individual silos which is right. something that we need to avoid so challenger 150 deuce you know obps all, all of them have their own how do we do this kind of thing now that we are endorsed as a program and we want to link to some, and CBET 2030 is one of the Ocean Decade programs also. So we want to link with those and do exactly what's, what you said, because it, uh, if we do, if, if we are 30 years from now, well, you know, in 2020, we collected the data. If, if only we had done that, you know, and we're constantly doing that. We're constantly asking that question. Yeah, good. Uh, Bob, you're next. Yeah, thanks, uh, Frank. That was excellent. It was nice to see all these things going on that I wasn't aware of. Um, so, a comment and then a question. So, just to follow up on Steve, you know, our Comet program here is a really good example of how we kind of integrated mapping with, uh, you know, what's really controlling the water properties. So, um, and 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 the WOS program provides another good example where it wasn't just physical oceanography, it was biology and, and chemistry. So um, yeah, I, I fully endorse what, what Steve was saying. So my question is, um, I am concerned when, when you look at something, someplace like the Florida Keys, and if you think about it in terms of a partial differential equation, um, there are lots of things independently that go into causing a change. And then the keys probably to, the most important thing has been the explosive uh, uh, development and, and, and human interaction, which may eclipse anything that, that nature is doing. So, you know, how do we distinguish those aspects when we're talking about diversity and, um, and, and intensity of, of, of organisms? And, and then I was also a little confused by your statement that between the small protected areas and the others, we don't see much of a difference. I mean, I personally took a you know a dive on the elbow, and I was amazed at, at the stacking up like cordwood of the fish. I mean, I've never seen more fish than than there. You know, my buddy and I were really frustrated. We wanted to spear some, but we couldn't. <laughs> I mean, but you can literally touch them. There was so many of them. You just swim up to them and touch them. Anyway, um, so but my 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 concern about aliasing and biasing and how we choose the regions to study and and how we sample them that, that that's a scientific concern. No, oh, it is. I mean, the the this reef fish visual, visual survey that's the name of the program that is conducted now. Unfortunately, every two years because as everything with these big monitoring programs, it used to be annually. Now it's every two years and. They are doing fewer stations and they're randomized. So the stations are ran. They, they go to specific reefs based on the, the kind of is it patch reef or linear reef or deep water reef. Uh, is it uh, doesn't have some structure, but it's not always the same reefs. So they try to uh, randomize their stations from sampling to sampling. So while it is a time series within a big area, uh, the the actual stations are not always the same. Like the um, uh, the coral reef environmental the, the monitoring program that FWRI con, uh, conducts every year, they go to the same place and they measure coral reefs every year in, in the same place. But other programs are not like that. So it it is sometimes hard to compare the data from one program to the other program. There are several programs measuring fish in the Florida Keys, but they measure them differently. Use the 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 some use acoustics, some use divers, some use divers doing a sim different sampling pattern. And when you try to put the data together, it's not easy. And now after some programs have been collecting data for 20 years and you ask them, well, can you change your method to one that is standard? They say, no, 
and they, they're right. No, so it, sometimes we have to live with that. That you have to compare apples and oranges. As long as it's always apples and always oranges, if you see a change, you may be able to make sense out of it. Okay, you. no, I can. I, you're as frustrated as I am. Then, <laughs> good luck. Thank you. Well, be, before we pause, uh, I must apologize. There's one thing very important I forgot. You know, my memory goes nuts these days. Uh, that is, students come first. You know, for every seminar, we encourage students to ask a question first. So this is the chance to make up. So I see we still have a lot, lot of students here. So students, do you have any questions for any of the three speakers this morning? So this is your chance to ask a question. Well, if not, or if you have questions, you can always ask later. Uh, if you don't have questions now, uh, let's thank all our speakers again this morning. And please come back before 1.30 or around you know, maybe 1.25. And we have two talks this afternoon about ecology and uh, marine animals. Thank you very much for your attendance and enjoy your lunch. So the afternoon session is shorter uh, because we have only two speakers. Um, the first talk will be given by uh, Dr. Brad Sebo on marine animal response to temperature change. I hope I interpret that correctly. So it's all yours, Brad. Take it away. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> this talk is about a project that uh, was recently funded by NSF, so uh, we're going to be testing these ideas in the next couple of years. I um, wanted to preface before I, I've got a pre-recorded talk um, that I prepared for a meeting recently that I'm going to play, but um, before I start that, I wanted to just preface um, a few terms. So what we're talking about is metabolically available habitat. This is um, habitat that can, based on species specific physiology, energetically support a population. And it's based on aerobic scope, which is the difference between resting and active metabolism. And I'll talk a little bit more about this, but um, basically if you imagine a fish sitting doing the minimum possible, um, it has a certain level of metabolism that supports all of the uh, internal processes uh, ion transport, protein synthesis, and things like that. And it has the ability, it has the gill capacity and the cardiac capacity to increase its oxygen supply and its metabolic rate if it's being chased by a predator. And there's a bunch of processes like growth and reproduction and things that have to be supported with, within that aerobic scope between the resting and the, and the maximum levels. And that aerobic scope varies with temperature uh, for ectotherms, um, and it varies with oxygen. Um, and we define a critical habitat limit, and this is um, based on um, a recent study by uh, Deutsch et al., where we published um, for about 70 species that species range limits are congruent with a factorial aerobic scope of about three. So that means they can increase their metabolic rate above that resting level um, by a factor of three at the limit of their, their range. And the hypothesis is that it's the aerobic scope that um, is either setting that range or that they have uh, evolved the ability to support that level of metabolism uh, within their uh, native habitat range. So metabolically available habitat. Uh, so, sorry to right. interrupt. <laughs> so uh, are you sharing okay. your screen? No, not yet. OK, so this is the introduction. Yes. OK. It's just a, a preface. I'm going to play the video here in a moment. Thanks All for right. clarifying. Sorry. <laughs> 
that's OK. So this uh, metabolically available habitat is not concerned um, with other potential limiting factors, uh, a number of things such as competition, predation, geographic barriers, life history requirements can determine where species do live. So we're just determining where they are physiologically able to live. So with that uh, preface in mind, I will play the video. So let's see if I can share my screen. Where did it go? Okay. Uh, share. Yeah. Trying to share a screen here. There we go. All right, can you guys uh, see a black screen there? Yep. Yes. Okay. Great. Can you hear it? No. No. Interesting. Um, so let me change my output here. Display audio. Let's try that. Species distribution. Right, start over here. Hold on. Thank you for joining my virtual talk. We'll be discussing trade offs between vertical and latitudinal habitat in diurnal vertical migrators. My co author for this talk is Matt Burke, who's a former student of mine who is starting a uh, position at St. Francis University in Pennsylvania. As the oceans warm, species distributions are shifting uh, primarily to higher latitudes. And the prevailing wisdom is that they are being forced out of their native territories by increasingly stressful warm temperatures. But in order to understand these distributional shifts, uh, a mechanistic understanding is, is required. Um, many maintain that um, habitat limits are set by oxygen supply and demand mismatch. That is, as temperature increases, the resting metabolic rate increases at a given rate, and the maximum metabolic rate increases more slowly due to oxygen limitations. So as you get toward uh, the warmer temperature range, uh, aerobic scope, the difference between the maximum and resting metabolic rate is diminished. Aerobic scope is thought to provide the oxygen necessary uh, to maintain any process beyond basic maintenance, such as locomotion, growth, and reproduction. Others maintain that uh, biogeography determines physiology, not the other way around. In other words, oxygen supply capacity evolves to match the maximum metabolic demand at the prevailing oxygen level and temperature. So regardless of temperature, oxygen supply and demand are matched at least within the native habitat range. Recently derived relationships between metabolic rates and their oxygen and temperature sensitivities allow us to test some of these ideas. Oxygen supply and demand under uh, any given circumstances um, are matched such as such that supply over demand is equal to one. Supply is a function of physiological mechanisms that take up oxygen and transport it to the rest of the body, represented here as alpha, and the environmental oxygen partial pressure, whereas demand is simply the metabolic rate measured as the rate of oxygen consumption. So how do we determine this oxygen supply capacity? What is it? <coughs> Excuse me. 
Uh, we can measure oxygen supply capacity using standard respirometry techniques. If you place an animal in a static chamber and allow it to consume the oxygen over time, uh, you can, you'll determine rates of oxygen consumption at any given partial pressure of oxygen. If you divide each of those bins, each metabolic rate divided by the corresponding partial pressure, you get a measure of the oxygen being supplied per unit of available oxygen pressure. As the oxygen consumption rate is maintained, but oxygen partial pressure declines, that oxygen supply increases. In other words, ventilation, cardiac output, and other mechanisms are increasing toward a maximum value, which is the oxygen supply capacity. That point is reached at the critical oxygen partial pressure, PC. So alpha oxygen supply capacity is equal to the metabolic rate divided by the critical pressure for that metabolic rate. If an animal has maintained a maximum activity during that um, trial, the oxygen supply measured at any given point is equivalent to the oxygen supply capacity. So these open symbols are an animal exercising maximally as oxygen partial pressure in the chamber declines. And on, on the left, you see those points um, fall on that line with a slope equal to alpha. Schematically, we can show this more clearly. <clears throat> it shows maximum metabolic rate being maintained as oxygen partial pressure declines down to some critical pressure, which is the critical pressure for maximum metabolism, PC max, and the standard or resting metabolic rate <clears throat> declines or is maintained as oxygen declines down to its critical pressure, the PC SMR. So SMR, the standard rate divided by its critical pressure is equivalent to MMR divided by its critical pressure. Each of those gives an identical value of alpha. And alpha is the slope of this line that describes the critical oxygen partial pressure for any given metabolic rate um, between resting and maximum activity. <laughs> if we rearrange this equation, we can um, determine the factorial aerobic scope, that is the maximum metabolic rate divided divided by the standard metabolic rate. And you can see that it's equivalent to the critical partial pressures for that maximum rate divided by the critical pressure for that standard rate. Because all these rates and their critical pressures are related, the temperature coefficients for those metrics are similar, similarly related. Uh, the temperature coefficient E is derived from Arrhenius plots, such as the one shown here on the right, which is the natural log of that metric um, plotted against the inverse of temperature. And you can see that uh, based on the uh, power vested in exponents that these temperature coefficients are related according to this equation. So for example, the the temperature coefficient for standard metabolic rate minus the temperature coefficient for its critical pressure should be equivalent to that for maximum minus its critical, critical oxygen partial pressure. And you can see with these values on the right um, that that is in fact the case for at least black sea bass shown here. We can use these relationships to determine the aerobic scope uh, for a species at any given oxygen and temperature throughout the environment. Most of the data that's available to date is um, highly biased toward coastal fishes. There are increasing measurements made in invertebrates, but again, they are largely coastal. Coastal environments differ from open ocean habitats in a number of important ways. Most importantly here, in coastal environments, we have a strong latitudinal and seasonal gradient in sea surface temperature and not much vertical gradient in temperature. Uh, these animals are relatively shallow living along the coast and there's no uniform oxygen pressure gradient um, across that latitude either. 
the open ocean is the largest single habitat um, on the planet, <clears throat> yet it's one of the least sampled and, and least studied. <clears throat> uh, this graph just shows that uh, about 93% of the available living space on the planet is in this vast volume of open ocean um, at depth between the surface and about 4,000 meters. And in these open ocean habitats, there are strong correlated vertical gradients in oxygen and temperature. So you can see in this plot that shows a latitudinal gradient in the eastern Pacific between 50 degrees north latitude and 50 degrees south, sorry, and across the 500 meter depth range that um, oxygen drops dramatically with depth in this entire pink region in the tropics has less than 2% air saturation. Those same waters um, are low in temperature, about 10 degrees Celsius. Temperature and oxygen are strongly correlated. So this is um, showing the correlated temperature and oxygen profiles for three distinct points along this transect that we measured. Uh, the California current, the Gulf of California between Baja and mainland Mexico, in the eastern tropical Pacific off Central America. And you can see that the oxygen values and temperatures differ between those three, um, but in each case, temperature and oxygen are strongly correlated. An additional way that the open ocean habitat varies um, or is distinct from coastal environments is in light. There's high light uh, in shallow water and it is diminished with depth such that um, below about 200 meters, uh, there's very little uh, visible light. So in shallow water where light is plentiful, you get strong predation pressure. Uh, animals can see each other and chase each other around. So you get, tend to get uh, torpedo shaped fast swimming fishes. And in the deep sea, uh, there's strong selection for sit and wait predation strategies such as that um, used by the angler fish. So there tend to be low metabolic rates in permanently deep living species and very high metabolic rates in shallow species. Well, here we're looking at vertical migrators that on a daily basis migrate from near surface waters during the night to deeper uh, waters around three or 400 meters during the daytime. And this is thought to be a predation avoidance strategy. They avoid this well-lit surface waters. Um, but in the process, they change temperature and oxygen quite dramatically. And just um, to give you an idea, these uh, euphousids, krill, and other vertical migrating animals are in such high abundance that they're clearly visible in acoustic signals like this. We also have data um, for tagging on larger um, species, such as the jumbo squid shown here, and they also migrate on a daily basis down to about 300 meters and return to the surface uh, at night. Just give you a, an idea of um, the size difference in some of these species. Euphousids, uh, krill, are fairly small crustaceans. There are a number of small squids and fishes, such as mctophid lantern fishes, that make up this migrating layer. Um, and then the jumbo squid, uh, reaches two meters in length. So this is sort of an oddball out, but um, undergoes the same behavior in the same environment. Uh, during recent warming events, such as the 97-98 El Nino, uh, a number of vertical migrators, including the jumbo squid, expanded their ranges into northern waters. Uh, this expansion was attributed to a number of things, including ocean deoxygenation, uh, increased uh, productivity, uh, changes in circulation, etc. But because these vertical migrators experience and seem to tolerate such a wide variation in temperature across their daily migration, uh, temperature was dismissed as a potential cause of this uh, migration, of this range expansion. So over the last decade, we've gone out to sea uh, numerous times and measured the environment, oxygen temperature in the environment using towed sensors, such as the, uh, this wire flyer shown here, developed by Chris Romland at the University of Rhode Island. Um, we also drug nets, such as this large Tucker trawl, 
um, and captured animals and performed respirometry experiments on board ship. So we <clears throat> measured uh, everything from tiny copepods up to these jumbo squids uh, on board ship. We measured the oxygen supply capacity um, with data shown here for euphausids, five euphausid species and the jumbo squid. These individual data points here are the jumbo squid and showed that the oxygen supply capacity is about three times higher than the mean value for coastal fishes such as black sea bass and cod and a number of others. More importantly, uh, the oxygen supply capacity is largely insensitive to temperature. It declines a little bit between 10 and 20 degrees, um, but for two species that we measured additionally at 25 degrees, oxygen supply capacity increases a little bit um, as you reach those slightly warmer temperatures. So the um, oxygen supply capacity temperature coefficient is slightly negative, whereas that for coastal fishes is strongly positive again, matching the maximum metabolic rate in those species. So what does this mean? Um, so again, the oxygen supply capacity is related, the temperature coefficients for oxygen supply capacity are related to that for maximum metabolic rate and its critical partial pressure, according to this equation. Schematically, we can see that um, as so using the same sort of schematic that I showed you earlier with maximum and resting metabolic rate, as it increases with temperature, as maximum metabolic rate increases with temperature, the oxygen supply capacity increases to match it. So the slope of this line is elevated relative to the colder temperature. The critical oxygen pressure for maximum metabolic rate stays constant near air saturation. So regardless of temperature, these coastal species have air saturated water to draw from. So there's no selective pressure on oxygen supply to be further elevated to deal with low oxygen at any temperature. In contrast, vertical migrators, oh, sorry, let me back up a second. Um, so you can see if the critical oxygen partial pressure temperature coefficient is zero, then alpha equals that for MMR. So the oxygen supply capacity temperature coefficient is the same as that for maximum metabolic rate. In vertical migrators, in contrast, the temperature coefficient for the oxygen supply capacity is near zero, largely insensitive to temperature, which means that the maximum metabolic rate and its critical pressure change by equivalent amounts with temperature. So as maximum metabolic rate increases, with temperature from blue to red here. Um, the slope of this line does not change, but the critical oxygen partial pressure for that maximum metabolic rate changes. So at colder temperatures, less oxygen is required to meet the maximum possible metabolic rate. So PC max increases with temperature by an equivalent amount as the maximum metabolic rate itself. So what is the uh, temperature coefficient? How much do maximum metabolic rate and its critical pressure change with temperature? So we've only measured that for Decidicus, but we can model it in uh, the other species as well. And interestingly, it turns out that it does not really matter what the temperature coefficient is uh, in terms of the aerobic scope that is achieved. So I'm going to walk through a series of um, schematics here that demonstrate this. So this shows the decline in temperature with depth. And because the oxygen supply capacity does not change with depth, both maximum metabolic rate and PC max will change equivalently with temperature. So here's maximum metabolic rate declining um, with a coefficient of 0.3, which is um, a low coefficient, but equivalent to what we find for several uh, coastal fishes. And PC max declining by an equivalent amount with a similar coefficient. 
So assuming for the moment that oxygen doesn't change with depth, you can see that PC max is always lower than the available oxygen, which means that maximum metabolic rate is never oxygen limited in this scenario. So we're in this part of the curve where oxygen does not limit maximum metabolic rate. Once we, once PO2 declines to meet maximum uh, critical pressure, then maximum metabolic rate would become dependent on oxygen. So in reality, oxygen drops quite rapidly with depth um, throughout the Eastern Pacific, something like this. So in this case, PO2 is less than PC max. The oxygen available is less than the critical pressure, which means we're in this part of the curve and maximum metabolic rate would be limited. So maximum metabolic rate is going to be lower at depth because it's oxygen limited. If PO2 oxygen partial pressure is less than the critical pressure, then MMR and the aerobic scope that result will be oxygen limited. So what happens if we have a high temperature sensitivity? Then both MMR and PC max decline more rapidly with depth than in the previous scenario. And as drawn here, uh, they have declined faster than the available oxygen, which means that PC max is again lower than PO2. And so oxygen is not limiting. However, the maximum metabolic rate and aerobic scope are lower due to temperature than they would have been if they were oxygen limited. So for the jumbo squid, we measured temperature sensitivities of MMR, maximum metabolic rate, and SMR, standard metabolic rate. And you can see that between 25 degrees and 20 degrees, maximum metabolic rate is very sensitive to temperature. So this Arrhenius plot on the right shows a temperature coefficient of 1.65. That's equivalent to a Q10 of about seven or eight. Once you get to 20 degrees, uh, the metabolic rate is far less sensitive to temperature um, with a temperature coefficient of about 0.21. That's um, rather low. So aerobic scope does not change much once you get to depth, but it's very low at depth because of this initial rapid drop. So we can use these values to <clears throat> see exactly how MMR and aerobic scope change with depth. So the red dots here are the actual measurements for Decidicus at temperatures equivalent to these depths. And so you can see this rapid decline in maximum metabolic rate due to temperature uh, initially, and then not much change beyond that. If they had a temperature coefficient of 0.8, um, as in the previous schematics, it would follow along this line. If they had a low temperature coefficient of 0.3, which is uh, similar to coastal fishes, uh, they would have been oxygen limited and been nearly as low as we measured in air saturated water. So aerobic scope is high in warm shallow water. But in the native habitat, the tropical habitat, aerobic scope is always low, either due to temperature or due to oxygen limitation. And this is consistent with um, me. this is consistent with direct observations we have of uh, squids here in shallow water from uh, scuba diving. These squids are extremely active at night, foraging over huge areas. That was the sound of a squid smacking into me and then stunning himself momentarily. So this is a rather <clears throat> small animal, but he regained his senses and swam off. These are squids observed from a remotely operated vehicle at 300 meters depth in the Gulf of California. And you can see that they're much more sluggish they do feed to some extent on these mctophid fishes, um, at least in the lights of the submersible. 
However, I think that's an artifact of the lights and also the, the turbulence generated by the thrusters. But they, both the uh, mctopids and the squids are extremely sluggish at these depths. So we use the temperature coefficients to map um, aerobic scope across a transect in the Eastern Pacific. So this is over the upper 500 meters depth range and from 50 north to 50 south. You can see the factorial aerobic scope is only high, only higher than three in the upper 150 or 200 meters uh, in the tropical environment. As you go deeper in the tropical environment, you hit this gray area, which is where aerobic scope is reduced to one, uh, meaning that uh, there's no scope for activity at that point. And actually metabolic suppression is required uh, during the daytime migration at depth in those areas. But at night, they can achieve quite high uh, activity levels and high aerobic scope in their native habitat. But what's interesting is that throughout the temperate and subpolar waters um, to the north and south, they do not achieve a factorial aerobic scope higher than three um, at any point, regardless of depth. So we're suggesting that this that cold water creates an energetic barrier that would prevent um, range expansion in these species. However, with just a little bit of warming, that uh, cold water barrier energetic barrier can be eliminated or at least alleviated. So this shows factorial aerobic scope in surface waters um, based on sea surface temperatures. This white line is the average from 1990 to 2020. And you can see again this high factorial aerobic scope that's generated in the tropics, but then it drops off dramatically at latitudes above about 20 north and 20 south. However, during the 1997-98 El Nino, um, you can see that the warmer water uh, allowed a range expansion of about 10 degrees latitude in either direction. And this is um, based on a factorial aerobic scope of three, which is shown to be um, a limit, a warm water limit for a variety of species. So if you assume a slightly lower cut off, lower factorial aerobic scope cut off, they might gain as much as 20 degrees latitude from this small amount of warming during El Nino years. So this is a schematic um, illustrating this take home point. So the bottom panel show the native tropical habitat. On the left is the present current situation and on the right is uh, in the future. As you can see, they have metabolically available habitat that we've defined defined as a factorial aerobic scope of three or higher. Um, they might reach some temperatures in the very near surface waters that are limiting in some cases, but uh, mostly shallow water is fine habitat for them. Excuse me. Um, and in the future, very little changes. They might lose a little bit of metabolically available habitat um, due to increased temperature or ocean deoxygenation, but um, our analysis suggests that the native habitat is largely unaffected uh, by climate change. Uh, however, in temperate waters, they're currently cold limited throughout, but with just a little bit of warming, uh, metabolically available habitat is greatly expanded. Ocean deoxygenation has relatively little effect, um, except at depths that are deeper than the typical migration for these species anyway. Right, so I'd like to thank a number of people who helped uh, collect data at sea and helped plan some of these uh, field excursions. Uh, Karen Wishner and Chris Roman at the University of Rhode Island, uh, Ruby Rosa and Lloyd Trueblood were uh, in my lab uh, many years ago, but uh, Ruby is currently at the University of Lisbon and Lloyd is at La Sierra University. Uh, Curtis Deutsch and Allison Mislan at uh, University of Washington. Matt Burke, as I mentioned, my co-author here, um, is now at St. Francis University, and Tracy Shaw is a technician and UFAL's expert. 
Um, this work was funded by NSF, NOAA, and California Sea Grant. Happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Let's see, how do I stop sharing? Yeah, let's see if we have questions uh, from students first. If you have questions, please raise your hand. And Well, I see your hand up, uh, but let's wait for five more seconds for students. Uh, please go ahead, Bob. Hey, Brad. Uh, excellent talk. Thank you. That's just the type of talk I was hoping we, you know, we, we develop. Um, so, squid have been around for a long time. And mm -hmm. ocean temperatures have varied substantially over the lifetime of uh, squids on this earth. And, and so, um, if we start talking about global warming and how that's going to impact various species from the point of view of, of oxygen, the warming is going to be a very small fraction of what the earth has experienced its ocean temperatures over the evolution of these of these animals. So um, in, in terms of kind of the, the biotic health of the of, of the oceans with respect to global warming, what you know can you comment on that? Um, yeah, I think it comes down to a, a matter of the the rate of warming um, as much as the amount I think you know the the amount that we're going to see may not be much in the you know geological history scheme but uh, for a hundred year period a couple of degrees can make a big difference and it's um, more than you know we don't really know much about the plasticity of these physiological traits and um, as far as we know there's not much so that's kind of an open question, but um, I would imagine that over a hundred years, that's kind of a, these changes are happening faster than they can acclimate and adapt to in many cases. So I think uh, range expansions, as we're already seeing in a large number of species, um, are going to continue to happen. So. Right. So so they you know we would expect them to migrate, I suppose. Um, both vertically and um, in, in the horizontal. But in terms of whether or not we will damage uh, as a whole the, you know, the species composition, do you think that's a, a possibility or is it simply going to be a migration? Um, I guess it depends on how you define damage as well. I mean, the, the previous uh, range expansion of the squids during the El Nino years um, had a big impact on a number of fisheries in the California current region and um, it definitely exposed species to a large predator that they had not seen before and uh, I think in the case of krill and some of these mctophids there's an equivalent migration by the temperate species further north and and maybe the the biggest damage are going to be to those that are already as far north as they can go they've got no room left to to expand their range so but uh, yeah there's definitely going to be ecosystem changes that will have effects that uh, the species will notice and in many cases we will if it affects fisheries and other things we care about thank you yeah well that thank is you. really a large question that deserves more discussions absolutely uh, later yeah. uh steve uh, I see you are next. Yep. Uh, thanks, Brad. Great talk. And, uh, you know, as Bob said, you know, big implications for how ecosystems are going to change. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on a number of studies uh, of warm pore rings in more northern latitudes have shown uh, changes in species composition and perhaps productivity. Uh, and is is that um, a, uh, a, a consequence of this thermal um, 
range expansion capability, or is that simply capturing productivity from other areas and moving it north? And you know, maybe this is a harbinger of, of things to come. Um, I don't know if I can answer that specifically, but I think um, it's certainly possible that that uh, could result from some of these uh, thermal tolerance of species, um, you know, sort of microcosm changes that are happening as well as the, the more macro scales. Um, but yeah, I don't know specifically what species are, uh, you know, very few species have had any physiological tolerances measured for them. So I think there's still far more questions than we have answers for, but. Thanks. It's kind of vague, but thanks. Um, Brad, well, maybe some of the audience don't know. Uh, you know, Brad has received this USF award for outstanding research for 2020 for his uh, thought provoking you. paper. Um, so, Brad, can you introduce your paper uh, in just one minute. Uh, yeah, I can try. Um, so uh, in the preface, I was referring to a paper by um, that was led by Curtis Deutsch, um, who, by the way, is recently for maybe in transit right now to Princeton University. He left University of Washington. Um, so that paper looked at some of these physiological traits in about 70 different species and their temperature coefficients. And we determined um, comparing that to biogeographic uh, ranges of these species that uh, factorial aerobic scope or a metabolic index, which is equivalent um, of about three is coincident with the, the limits of these ranges um, for these 70 or so species. So uh, you can then project where that limit moves with climate if you have good oxygen and temperature models. And so it's a it's a mechanism to predict um, species movements with climate change. Thank you. Thank you. That is very relevant, relevant to just the, the two questions by Steve and uh, Bob. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank let's you. Uh, thank uh, Dr. Brad Siebel for the out outstanding talk. Thank you all. Then we move to our next, uh, the last uh, speaker, um, Dr. Ken Answorth on ecological modeling of the Gulf of Mexico. Hmm. Thanks, Juan Sure. Okay. <coughs> Hi everyone, um, I'm Cameron Ainsworth. I'm an associate professor at CMS and I direct the Fisheries and Ecosystem Ecology Laboratory. My students and I use statistical and numerical modeling to study marine communities. Um, our past studies have focused on fisheries management, climate change, marine pollution, and, and population dynamics. Much of my work is centered on the use of food web models and biogeochemical models like Atlantis. Atlantis is called an end-to-end -end model because it includes bacteria to apex predators. It links together models of circulation, nitrogen cycling, food web dynamics, and human impacts. So I've developed a Gulf of Mexico Atlantis model as well as a Campeche Bay model. And most of our applications so far have related to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, which uh, we studied as part of Sea Image. Species distributions in Atlantis are supported by a series of papers uh, on spatial statistical modeling methods, including GAMS, mixed models, uh, maximum entropy models, and other methods and other methods. Uh, innovations in these statistical models account for spatial autocorrelation and presence only data, which is typical of mammals and other animals that rely on opportunistic uh, reporting. We also work on statistical modeling of diet compositions in support of ecosystem modeling. 
Um, Becky Scott, my PhD student, is exploring, uh, exploring a wide range of statistical methods to characterize the diet. Uh, most of what we've done so far has used a statistical distribution called a Dirichlet function. It's a multivariate function, so it can represent covariation between prey items. Um, and with the, this description of error of these diet linkages, we can, we can approach Atlanta simulations probabilistically, which is a novel contribution. So in this 2018 paper, we evaluated the range of possible outcomes from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill model modeling by means of a Monte Carlo analysis of the diet matrix. So diet is typically a, a major source of uncertainty and we, we draw from those uh, probability distributions. We use cloud computing for simulations to provide about, I think it was the equivalent of 3.4 CPU years of computing time. And we leverage those outputs to train statistical emulators, which can predict the full range of responses that are possible from Atlantis. So this is a means of fully sampling a very large parameter space. Atlantis has a slow runtime. On the right, you'll see resulting, uh, the resulting range of uncertainty in oil spill recovery traje trajectories. The GOM Atlantis model played an important synthesis role in C-Image, and I'll just provide a few highlights. We used mesocosm experiments from MOAT, fish lesion data from Steve Murawski's long lines, um, oil fate data from the University of Miami, high pressure experiments from our partners in Germany, and sediment cores from Isabel Romero and David Hollander at CMS. We also incorporated reef ROV data from the University of Florida. So after, um, uh, well, almost 10 years, these are, the, these are the main takeaways. So the recovery times are more than 10 years for many species, although there is a range. Yet there doesn't seem to be any permanent state change with the deep water horizon. More or less species return to their pre-spill condition. The effects are translated far away from the well due to uh, the effects of larval transport and migration of affected populations. Apparently, there is some avoidance ability in large pelagic fish because the model predicts a greater impact than, than was seen in reality. And um, Deepwater Horizon caused more of a disturbance to the ecosystem than the Ixtoc oil spill in 1979 because the oil sat in place for a longer time. And one last takeaway is that there um, were major impacts on juvenile fish only by virtue of where they were located. We didn't even assume that they were, you know, more vulnerable. It's just that they happen to be inshore where the, where the oil uh, interacted with them. Um, and, and this led to recurrent recruitment lows that followed the initial impact and then persisted over several generations. So, um, you know, Sea Image was part of Gomery. Gomery is the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. It was a, an independent body that administered Deepwater Horizon research funds. And Gomery concluded in uh, 2020, and I was involved in some of the synthesis and legacy efforts. So one of our products is this 2021 article, which reviews all the simulation modeling that was done for the oil spill from Gomery, uh, NERDA, nat the uh, Natural Resource Damage Assessment, and other, and other authors. Takeaways from that work, there was 330 published modeling applications. A majority, 65%, used a physical model in some regard. And 5% achieve integration across physics, biology, and economics, and, and that uh, would include Atlantis modeling in there. Uh, and in addition, there was a strong linkage to field and laboratory experiments in many disciplines. This is a spin-off work from the Sea Image oil spill uh, project. We believe there were impacts to the mesopelagic fish community from the oil spill. And this can hold implications for exploited pelagic species that rely on mesopelagic forage. So this is the subject of Becky Scott's dissertation. This is an echogram of the West Florida shelf taken from a Sea Image cruise. And this illustrates three mechanisms for exchange between the mesopelagic and the epipelagic food webs. A shows small mesopelagic fish, mainly mctophids, uh, 
Brad gave a, a, a good uh, slide on that and, and showed some of these vertical migrators. Um, and these, these are undergoing diel migration to the surface. And then B shows large uh, pelagic predators like swordfish and escalars migrating to the surface at night to feed. And C shows large pelagic predators hunting in deep water. So that's at least three connections between the epi and mesopelagic food webs, which Becky is attempting to capture in Atlantis. We recently incorporated larval dispersal into Atlantis. This is based on Kelly Vassbinder's uh, dissertation. She used CMAP ichthyoplankton sampling data. Um, the larvae are captured at some known age, which she determined based on their length by developing her own larval growth models, and that has been published now. Uh, Kelly really did a terrific job. She built an individual based model for larval transport, which uses hydrodynamic data provided by Bob Weisberg and Yong Gang Liu, uh, but she wrote all the numerical integration code herself. She ran the movement of larvae back to the origin to identify the spawning sites, and she ran them forward to the end of the pelagic larval phase to identify the settling sites. And she did this, I think, for about 40 or 45 species, if I remember. Now, we didn't assume surface transport, as is often done. She developed generalized additive models to estimate the depth of larvae at different depth ages as, as, they, as they age, um, as different ages. Uh, some people, uh, some species go down as they get older, some go down and then come back up. So this provides vertical migration behavior, which affects what currents the larvae ride, because uh, WFCOM is vertically resolved, of course. Um, so what effect does larval dispersal have in the model? With dispersal in place, the outer West Florida shelf receives more production than expected. Uh, so this provides a hydrodynamic explanation for larvae settling on the outer shelf. And I'm hopeful that Hallie Repetta, a PhD student who just joined in this fall, uh, may pick up this work and possibly look at implications for MPA design. Um, so moving on to another project, this is a project that Chris Stallings and I are working on together to examine the value of artificial reefs as management tools. He has a number of natural and artificial reefs near Tampa Bay, which he has monitored for many years using divers and video methods. And Tiff Ratzel is using Ecopath with Ecosim to estimate structural and functional differences between natural and artificial reefs. We hypothesize that natural reefs may be more resilient to pulse disturbance because there's more diversity in the assemblage, and we are using harmful algal blooms in the model as an example stressor. Uh, that builds on the work of a former master student of mine, Alicia Gray, who is currently a NOAA employee at the Southeast Regional Office. Um, I'm currently working on a Restore Act project um, to determine the marginal value of seagrass to turtles, birds, and mammals. Uh, if you look at that graph on the right, the seagrass uh, density or coverage is on the x-axis and the carrying capacity is on the y-axis, and so this will be done for every species in the seagrass assemblage. So by ramping up the seagrass in Atlantis uh, and we run the model out to equilibrium, we can sketch these curves. And we can see at what point the marginal benefit on carrying capacity begins to diminish. Um, we'll, uh, yeah, and I have, uh, I'm using a, a, a quite sophisticated and novel seagrass routine, uh, which has never been published in Atlantis, which offers far superior representation of grazing ecology. This routine partitions seagrass production into fast growing leaves and epiphytes, which all grazers have access to and then slow growing roots and rhizomes, which are only available to manatees because they, they pull up the whole plant. And so we represent their keystone role as a habitat modifier. And this will have an effect on the entire seagrass assemblage. And B. Combs has contributed a generalized additive model of habitat association uh, 
uh, which allows us to better represent the seagrass community and and represent changes in prey in 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 seagrass environments. And Chuan Min Hu is providing uh, data for harmful algal blooms, which we'll use to future proof our estimates uh, when we hit with uh, increasing um, you know, series of disturbances to see whether that affects the marginal value of seagrass. And then um, finally, uh, this is what we have on the horizon here is a brand new project being funded by the Southeast Fisheries Science Center. It includes a three year postdoc. And so this will be an expert review panel uh, of the GOM Atlantis model and also NOAA training with the goal of encouraging the use of the GOM Atlantis model in stock assessments in the, in the Southeast region. And so this is in cooperation with my former student, Michelle Massey, who also works at the, uh, at the Southeast uh, regional office. Uh, that's, that's everything. Thanks very much. Thank you, Cam. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now we have time for questions. Uh, again, students first. Now time for uh, questions from all audience. Last speaker. We have all afternoon. <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, well, if uh, perhaps others can still think about the questions, I have a short one. Um, so how portable is this model if you know, a student from other group wants to play with it for another region uh, for, for another group did you say like yeah not not from your group let's say i want to play with the model oh uh, for um the southern ocean or you know for another you know semi enclosed from sea yeah. yeah well you know atlantis um doesn't have a, a user interface it's all you interface with it through text files and so basically you have to program no matter what it no matter what data you have to pull out, you have to write a program that will extract it. So I would say it's not that easy. Um, uh, you know, if, if it's something simple like, uh, say, like seagrass, uh, that's easy enough to do. That's a quick change, but then the results, you know, require quite a bit. Yeah, it's, to, yeah. to get into a cell and see what's happening into a cell requires patient yeah. Well, your sound is up and down. Um, I'll turn down my volume. All right. Thank you. Now it's much better. Um, now, uh, okay. Thank you, um, you know, for answering that question. I know it's, it's, it takes time to learn. It's not that easy. Yeah. People spend years to develop uh, this model. There are easier models for first students. Well, you have a static image. And uh, your voice almost disappeared. Well, I'm not sure what to do. Uh, turn off my video. Yeah. yeah. Um, Steve, you have a question? Yeah, Cam, thanks uh, for that review of the projects going on. I'm intrigued by the um, project that you've got on seagrasses. Um, we've recently had some conversations with uh, folks at Swift Mud. And they, uh, of course, do the seagrass assessments in Tampa Bay and Sarasota Bay, you know, based on aircraft. And and they've been seeing declines in seagrass. And they can, you know, there's various theories about that, but um, they're worried about two things. Number one, turbidity, right, which might be a function of the amount of nutrients in the water, and also um, climate change. That the water, as the water depth goes up. Um, you know, the, the seagrass, you know, um, is light limited, right? So that even a few centimeters of increased water depth might actually be sort of uh, negatively impacting it. And I'm wondering if you can account for those kinds of mechanisms in your Atlantis model, because I think it would be quite valuable to understand the directionality of seagrass uh, from, you know, the environmental side, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah we sure can. That That's uh, what, what, 
um, that routine is, is good at. Um, you know, one of the things that um, that, that routine adds is the presence of the epiphytes on the, on the leaves, and then there's a shading coefficient. So if the epiphytes overgrow, then, uh, then, then the seagrass can, can die. And uh, there's also, um, you know, um, water, uh, 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 words escaping me now, but uh, yeah, a coefficient of light absorption in, in the in the uh, wa in the water column that we can play with, and um, yeah, there there's uh, there are ways that we can simulate shading and actually link it to dynamic phytoplankton blooms, and that's that's one of our goals. Uh, I mentioned that we were using um, HAB data, which uh, Chuan Min is providing, and so that will be that that will be um, handled dynamically and will affect the shading and, and, and the benthic algal production and, and seagrass production. Very cool. Thanks. Any more questions from audience? Um, well, if not, uh, let's thank Dr. Sibo and uh, Dr. Answorth again this afternoon for giving me outstanding talks. Thanks, everybody. So this will conclude our faculty seminar, but remember, starting from next week, we'll start our seminar series uh, hosted by uh, Dr. Emilia Shemenow. So please join Roger, us. Can I interrupt? Our first seminar is September 10th. I'm sorry. So okay. It's on holiday weekend next weekend. All right. So we have a one week in between. Um, okay. So please yeah, join our seminar series uh, one week later or two weeks later. Um, thank you very much for attending and uh, you all have a great weekend. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks for hosting. Thank you,